This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages in growing. Now, please enjoy this message. Okay, man. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Man, you filled that section up. Where'd you have those people hiding at? <laughs> Out there doing a background check on them or what? <laughs> Were you all in another room, huh? I'm glad you joined us. It looks better this way. Amen. Y'all good? Well, I'm, I'm just excited. Uh, those invites, I don't turn those down, by the way. I just don't have enough time to go to all of them. I wish I could. Uh, but it's true. It's a dilemma. It's, it's a lot of hunger, and that's exciting, isn't it? There's like, I'm just one fella, and, and I get a lot of invites year after year, and that excites me in one hand, that there's a lot of hunger. People are wanting to hear what's being said and growing in the truth and going after God. And that's very exciting. The downside is you can't go everywhere. And uh, I, do, I do about 45 weekends a year. So uh, this is one of them. And uh, I told Robert I'd come back here just because I love him. And uh, <laughs> he's a pretty special guy. So, and he made me a big steak one time. So <laughs> I thought if I come back, he might make me another one. <laughs> so it, it was really good. Oh, man, it was good. It was a special grill, you know. And I was like... <laughs> So I said, oh, Lord, I got to go there. <laughs> Just having fun with you. <laughs> but it is true. <laughs> so, uh, man, the gospel. What do you say? I know, I know Pastor Robert already prayed. I don't normally feel this way in the beginning. I'm just ready to roll. But can we just pray something one more time? Can we just do something? Like some of you guys who traveled in to be here, who came from wherever, like out and about and came here, like wasn't just local. Yeah, a bunch of folks. So, uh, Man, you're here. You're all here. You're here. So, uh, man, let's open our heart and let's, let's ask the Lord to really teach us tonight and really hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And if you would pray for me that it would just be crystal clear and that it would be what he would say. If Pastor Robert would have handed the Lord a mic tonight, that that's what you'd get. Can we believe that? Yeah. Father, we just thank you tonight. and We just yield ourselves to you and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come in a very special and real way. We open as a group yes. our heart to you. Yes. And we ask you to teach us through your word. We just yield ourselves to you. We ask you to make it so clear that every heart would, would see and know and every eye would see and understand that, Lord God, we would absolutely be sowed into, seated into, and transformed by our time in you. Have your way. Do what you want to do. We yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 So I'm just going to pour out my heart. Uh, I'm not even sure I opened my Bible by faith. I, I, have, I have a lot in my heart. So, you know, I don't have a sermon. Those of you that know me, I don't like have a sermon set for tonight that I'm going to preach. So if that's a little different for some of you in your background, just pay attention. Don't write me off too quick, okay? If, if you listen, I share a lot of the word. Last time I was here, I actually quoted the verses, the address, where and where. I don't always do that. I think I did that for some folks here. Jesus loves people. So uh, I know some of you aren't here. You're, you're just here. You're hungry. Some of you watch YouTube. Some of you might be here to check me out. Just pay attention, and I think we'll pass the test tonight. <laughs> it's, just, it's just fun, man. I get checked out a lot. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, people live that way. They live checking people out. You know, you sit on an airplane, people are checking you out. They, they ask, oh, well, what are you? Oh, and they got beliefs and they're, they're weighing your answers. But when you live him, not just preach him, when you live him, your answers are easy. Like if you're living out, if you're just, if, if, if you're just trying to, if your theology is your relationship, it's probably dry and probably won't pass the test. You'll probably get nervous and stumble over your words. But if your relationship fleshes out your theology, it's different. You can talk about who he is and where you've been and knowing him. and Yeah? And it's just real good. Like if you're free, if you're really free, like you know if you're free. Come on, you know if you're free. You know if you're free or if you're caught up on the inside with a bunch of whatevers and, ooh, and first impressions and judgment and critical stuff and little down moments. And, or if you're just free. You know if you're free. Like, I'm not going to try to figure that out. I'm just going to enjoy being free. <laughs> Live my life in Jesus and talk about it. And they give me a mic, so I talk about it. But uh, that is the truth. You know if you're free. 
And if you're not free, don't be quick to be critical in your life in any area. Talk to God and be open to learn and understand. Because if you hold on to the same old things and you're not free, why are you expecting change? Listen, you could have been taught something since you were a little child in, in, in Sunday school. And taught it your whole life. But if it didn't bring freedom to your life. And it didn't take you face to face with him. And it didn't liberate your heart to receive his love and to live in the spirit. Then why would you make it that important? Because you were taught it your whole life. It happened in Jesus' day. This is a little freaky to me. This is a little like freaky. That truth itself could stand in front of people for several years. Like the person truth. This is sobering. This makes me cry. The person truth. His name's Jesus. Truth stood in front of people for years and spoke directly to them, and they couldn't hear what he was saying. And ultimately crucified him, calling him a heretic or a liar. And he is the truth. He's not a truth. He's the truth. They didn't just disagree with him. He was so wrong in their eyes, he was worthy of death. That's how far from truth man has been removed. That when truth spoke, they couldn't hear. They couldn't recognize. What causes that? When the only reason they listen is for what they don't agree with instead of what he's saying. And then it defines how you hear. And Jesus said, be careful how you hear. And Jesus cried out with passion. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And that's why Jesus was saying these phrases. Because here he is, truth himself. And the first thing he did when he came to the people was weep with compassion. He didn't weep with disgust. He weeped with compassion. Because they were people. They were sheep without a shepherd. And he came to shepherd. He's a John 10 good shepherd, right? He came to shepherd. He was, the, he was there to shepherd. And he saw they were sheep without a shepherd. And he wept with compassion because they had no one to lead, guide, tend, direct, protect, and feed the sheep. Right? That's amazing. I've been camping on this for a, a while and thinking about this. You think 25 years saved and preaching all around like I get to do. And I've had a lot of fun in my 25 years, more than I could describe. It would make me cry. But this one thought's been hanging me up for a while. And I've been taking my time there and I talk about it. And some people look funny because they're thinking, well, you should have saw that a long time ago. But it's, it's not something I move on from. None of the gospel is. Him loving me is fresh every day. Jesus dying on the cross for the remission of my sin and me being clean in his sight is a big deal every day. It's not old hat. It's not old theology. It's not, hey, how about preaching something new? It's always new. Jesus loving me is a big deal. Yeah? But this is what I've been thinking about. I've been thinking about Jesus actually coming and what it took, like, like, if he'd have just showed up in the wilderness, Robert, if he'd have just showed up out there in the wilderness at age 30, ready to roll, that would have been one thing. We could figure that out. God just beamed him down as a 30-year-old man in a body, and he's anointed and empowered, and he has the plans of the Father and Holy Spirit's with him, and he just gets it on and does what he has to do. But that's not what he had to do. He had to come as a man. He had to fulfill what man failed. He had to fulfill the law. He had to do it unto all righteousness so that when he was crucified, his innocent blood would have the power to, to, to cleanse the guilty blood, to wash people clean, to forgive people, to make people saved, right? So Jesus was, was, was on the earth as a man, but he couldn't take a shortcut. And this is what impresses me because all of us, we don't even remember gestation. We don't remember sitting in our mama's womb. We don't remember feed, being fed a bottle or nursing or having our little diapers changed all the time. We don't remember crying every other couple hours when we were born and being totally dependent. We don't even remember that season. And some of us can only remember back to certain ages and dates. My memory doesn't seem to go back real far. Some people remember like four and I don't know. I'm kind of even blurry at about age six. I am. I don't know why. It probably wasn't a lot good to remember there. It's probably a gift. <laughs> what I'm getting at, he couldn't take a shortcut. And this just impresses me because I think about this because he's God. He's, he's God. He was, he is, and he is to come. Like, there's no time frame on God. You can't go back and, like, people say, well, where'd God come from? I don't know. He's from the beginning. And, and when you look the word up, it means a time that goes back and back and back till there is no beginning. 
So the intellectual mind can't embrace that because there's no real answer. What, you mean he just always was? Well, how'd he get so much power and where'd he come from? I don't know. I'm a preacher. I'm telling you, I don't know. He just always was. And he's amazing. And he is and he always will be. But that God that's all powerful and almighty and amazing that tracked me down and saved my life and, and loved me when I was totally unlovely. Anybody have a story like that? When my attitudes were so gross, when my selfishness was so at a peak, when everybody I said I loved, I was using and abusing for my own sake, when I didn't even like myself and needed you to like me to believe I was even likable. Anybody relate to anything like that? In that moment, he came. I didn't invite him. I didn't ask him. I had him seated into me all along the way. But he just shows up at work and saves my soul. And I leave work changed. You say, calm down. No, you're wrong. No, you're way wrong. It ain't time to calm down. The God of the universe put himself in the womb of a young lady called Mary. That's a freak out. I don't think we camped there long enough. I think we're too busy with baby in a manger and Jesus crucified on a cross and Easter and Christmas and all the stuff we make it. But chill with me just for a minute tonight. And just think about this. That the God of the universe laid down his glory, made himself of no reputation, and allowed Holy Spirit to plant him in the womb of a woman. And he hung out there for nine months. Inside a woman. We got, any, we got a 15 year old here. Don't be ashamed. 15 year old. Stand up honey. Now look at her. Ain't she precious? 15 years old. Theologians think Mary was right around that age. Right there. Wholesome. Sweet as good pie. Right? Just <laughs> precious. You can sit down. I don't want to make you any redder. Thank you though. 15. Jesus said, okay, I'm going to hang out in her. Handpicked by God, my father, Mary. I'm going to hang out in her. I'm going to be born of her. He was born of a woman. He had to come through her body, through her birth canal, and be born of a woman and come as a man. Now see, when I was young, nobody talked like this to me. They just said, Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins because I'm such a sinner, which I was such a sinner. And, it, and you, you do a lot of things that are, and you just get all messed up like I said a while ago. And selfishness, who knows we were a mess, right? So he dies on the cross. But here's where we leave the gospel. He dies on the cross because we're sinners. So we have a way to be forgiven. So someday when the bell rings, we can go to heaven. And that's where we stop. And that's why we make the gospel. The gospel, the, the, that's, the gospel is way beyond there. We're just getting forgiven so we can go to heaven someday. There's so many questions behind that. There's so much mystery shrouded there. You'll never see the love of God in that. You'll say, why? Why would he save me? Why would he care? Why does he want me in heaven? Who's ever done that growing up? Who did this message we preach ever leave wondering and leave short rather than, whoa? <laughs> Come on, how many of us just went to summer Bible school and just went, whoa, Jesus, and surrendered? There's some along the way that seem to see something. But the way the gospel was taught to me, nobody taught me the truth about the gospel. Nobody made a big deal about Jesus actually what he had to do. To qualify me. He had to fulfill what I failed. He had to model what God made man to be. So he said follow me. Because the life he lived is what I was designed for. He didn't ever said follow me if I couldn't. He said when you see me you see the. And yet he said follow me. What are people to see in you? He told you in 1 John 5 to walk in the light as he's in the light. He said in 1 John 4, you have boldness in that day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. He's talking about love. He's talking about what Jesus walked out. Come on, Jesus was hated. They backbit him. They teamed up on him. They schemed against him. When he healed somebody, they had to find something wrong with it. They had to say there was a demon behind it. 
They do that in the church today like big time. Like there's groups and groups of people called Christian that, that try to shout down the move of God and dissect it and find out what's wrong with it. But if you really look, a lot of people that are doing that, and I would like to challenge the people doing that if anybody watches this, where is your joy? Where's your fruit? Where's your peacemaking? Because the people that are doing that, I don't see freedom in. Uh, sometimes I see hostility, criticism, judgment, all the things he's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's what impresses me. See, no, no preacher ever told me this. I'm going to make sure that if you came here and you're going to sit under my heart and, and dare open your heart and dare listen and take a little bit of time to hear what I have to say. Because no preacher ever told me this in my life. I'm not angry about it. I'm just going to make sure it doesn't happen. If I have a microphone, nobody ever told me that Jesus came to restore the truth about my life. They just said he came because I was a sinner. And it left me a hopefully forgiven sinner that was still condemned and more aware of my ability to fail and had really no ability to do any different. Who can relate to that? No preacher ever told me he died on the cross to restore my value, my purpose, my destiny, and my potential. They all told me he died on the cross because I was a sinner. Now, this isn't a play on words. Listen carefully. I've learned since he had to die because I was a sinner. But he didn't die because I was a sinner. He died to forgive me of the sin. He died because I was a lost son and he wanted to restore the truth about my life. Come on, be real with me. Now that's goodness. That's mind-boggling. That's whoa. Because I've done nothing right. The only thing I can do is believe. Believe that this is true. And let this truth begin to transform my want to, my desire, my discipline life. All of a sudden, I'm not trying to be a good boy. I'm his boy. And I didn't do a thing. He made me clean. He said, stand before me and be clean. Jesus said to his own disciples, you're clean because of the word that I've spoken. That was before the cross. His mercy had him already here. He wasn't imputing the world's trespasses to them, 2 Corinthians 5. He wasn't imputing. God was reconciling the world to himself through Jesus, not imputing their sins. Why? He was looking at what they're created for. He was looking at their created value, their purpose, and their potential. And love has never failed. He didn't take our sin personal. He took our purpose personal. And Jesus said, I'll tell you what, that's worth dying for. If I can die and raise from the dead and bring to life their destiny, I'll do it. He ain't just dying to forgive us every day we fail, guys. He's dying so he can put his spirit back in us. We can have new life through Jesus Christ. We can put off the old and we can put on the new. That's why he died. It's all through the Bible. You die in the likeness of his death. You live unto God. You die to sin once and for all. You live unto God. You raise in the newness of life. You raise in the resurrection power of God. Why? Because you already died in the likeness of his death. And if you died, surely you'll raise. It's not just about dying. It's about living in him. But this is my point, and I'm still trying to make it. <laughs> that if the God of the universe would humble himself to put himself in a 15-year-old or whatever, 14, 16, 18, don't get critical about that stuff. Theologians just seem to think she was right around her age. So I had her stand up because I'm like, whoa, Jesus, the God of the universe, the one that nothing was made that wasn't made through him, shows up on the scene through the birth of a baby from Mary, and he's the baby. He, that's incredible. <laughs> he must think a lot of what he's paying for. This is what we think is blasphemy and heresy. We think to talk ourselves down is to lift him up, but he set us in heavenly places. Let's just get over it and stop being falsely humble. Yeah. Let's just put on a garment of salvation. Let's just wear a robe of righteousness. Let's just go ahead and shot our feet full of peace. 
Yeah? yeah. And stop fighting over old things. It, Jesus must think a lot of the potential of mankind. I bet he was there in the beginning. I bet he had a lot to do with who we are and why we're here. I bet he's in on the inside information. I bet he knows our purpose and potential. I bet he knows what we all will look like if we would ever just completely yield to the power of Holy Spirit. I bet he knows what that looks like. And I bet he believes it's worth paying for. And then all my life I'm taught that he just paid to forgive me and take me to heaven when the bell rings. And then people live with a sense of comfort and life insurance because they prayed the prayer when they were 12. But they're caught up in turmoil and mad at their boss and shout down their spouse. But at least they're forgiven. This thing ain't about forgiveness. It's about transformation. And you can't step into transformation unless you pass through forgiveness. And if you understand the power of forgiveness, it'll inspire you to transformation. And it ain't you biting your lip to be better. It's you seeing different. Understanding what you're created for and called to. You weren't created to be self-centered. You were created to walk in love. You weren't created to be needy. He's your shepherd. You shall not want. You're fulfilled in his love. Yeah? You weren't made to desperately need love from all these angles. You were made to be love from his angle. Come on. I can back that up with tons of scripture. Didn't God make us in his image in the beginning? Didn't he say, let us make man in our image? What do you think? He's talking about a head and arms and legs? No, he's not. God's God's a spirit. There's nowhere in the Bible that says God has arms and legs and a head. He's a spirit. God is spirit. Jesus had to put on a body. And come as the likeness of sinful flesh. Before God made man, there wasn't nothing like that. Just God was a spirit. He didn't have a body. Jesus had to take on a body to restore man. Why did he give us a body? To act out what's on the inside. Ain't that something? <laughs> Let us make man in our image. He's talking about who he is, not what he looks like. He's not talking about hair color and eyes. We're all different. He can't be talking about that. He can't be talking about human form. Can he? I was looking for a guy, but she'll do. Did you jump up? We won't embarrass you. Different gender, so this will really serve the point well. Different, different ethnic backgrounds. Would you ever mix us up? Is there anything about us that's the same in the natural? Are we totally different? Yeah, but watch this. We can both wake up in the morning and look just like him. And that's what makes us one. That's what makes us the body of Christ. Because it's obvious she's a girl and I'm a guy. It's obvious we come from different backgrounds. There's so much diversity right here. And yet we have true unity when we live for the same reason. And that's why we're one. Thank you. Make sense? I picked her on purpose because it's... It's a visual. It hits at home. Same value. Same value. Same value. Same value. We both cost him the blood. You go into Walmart, there's different price tags because there's different values. Price checks, barcodes, screener. You go into the store of humanity and the same tags on every head. Why? Everybody's worth the same exact thing, his image. Doesn't matter if you're a guy, a girl. It doesn't matter if you're higher up in a business or if you feel like you're a janitor and you're... There's no low life on the earth. John said it well. Every mountain, every valley... We're all in the same place. In desperate need of his mercy and the shedding of his blood so we can live life by his spirit. There's no hot shot. There's no low life. There's just people that are saved and set free. And we are what we are by the grace of God. Same price tag on every head. 
That means everybody possesses the same exact value. Now be honest. Not many of us in this room has ever believed that. Low esteem, insecurity, fear of man, don't like ourselves, don't like others. Come on. I guess this truth has been lost. Racism. Let me make a strong statement in this church. I don't know why I would say it here. If you have racism in your life even a little bit, you can't know the Lord. How's that for strong? I'm talking even a little bit of racism. You can't know him. You can talk about him. You can serve things that have to do with him. You can attend where he is. <laughs> but you can't truly know him. If racism exists in your life. It's true. I'm talking on any level. I'm not just talking skin color. I'm talking on any level. Because the image of God is what? Love. Love doesn't seek its own. So that wipes it out right there. <laughs> your own preference. Your own desires. First impressions. Jesus never taught us that stuff. The world taught us that stuff. Adam, the fall of man, taught us that stuff. Nobody taught you to be angry, frustrated, jealous, insecure. Come on, it just came by instinct through birth. Into the fall of man. You didn't have to study to be angry. You didn't have to stay up late to conquer jealousy. and Meaning pull it off and be jealous. You didn't have to study long and hard to be insecure. It came with the package of self-centeredness. And every person in this room was born into Adam. And you must be born... Again, come on, get this with me tonight. Let me get a little intense and aggressive. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Self-centeredness. The first thing a little child does is say, mine, mm, no, as sweet as they are. I love them. I wish I had a million grandkids. You have no idea. I try to make everybody's kids my grandkids. I stay at, at people's homes everywhere I go. My goal is if they have little kids that they cry when I leave, that they get so attached to me because I love them. I just, I want them to cry when I leave. It's so bad. <laughs> No, and they had an amazing time. <laughs> I won a little girl over last week, and her mom said, you little traitor. I said, she's not a traitor. Children perceive Jesus. She got hurt and bypassed mama. Came to me. I was in the house about six minutes. Woo! <laughs> She wasn't really hurt. She was just crying. Mama's sweet. Mama's a great mama. Come here, honey. I'll hold you. You're not really hurt. Come on. I said, hey, little sweetie. Hey, you want to come here? I'll hold you, honey. Shoop. <laughs> she said, you little traitor. <laughs> but who knows that little baby's going to need born again sometime. Who knows the first things they learn is mine. Uh, no. And we just think it's normal because it was all of us. <laughs> and it's everybody you've ever seen. But it's not normal. Jesus never taught us that. The fall of man taught us that. Jesus never said, if anybody comes after me, make sure you pray a prayer at the right time, in the right moment, called the sinner's prayer, so you can make sure you go to heaven in case you die on the way home. Jesus said, if you come after me, if you decide you're going to follow me and come after me, you have to deny yourself. You have to pick up your cross and follow me. Not just sing to me, not just pray to me when things are tight. Deny yourself. People, it's simple. The self thing, I talked about the racism thing. Selfishness keeps all those things alive. Self-centeredness keeps first impressions alive, judgments alive, criticisms alive, unforgiveness alive. 
If you and I woke up to shine, if we woke up to manifest his image, if we woke up to love, this sister that I had stand up with me, if we just woke up every day to pursue his image, that makes us one, even if we live a thousand miles apart, that makes us the body of Christ. That's an army. That's powerful. That's unstoppable. If we all leave here and start pursuing this truth, think of the impact we could all have in our lives. Just think how we'd affect our spheres of influence. That it wouldn't just be one house called a church rocking it for Jesus. It would just be his people waking up every day understanding why they're alive. Watch. And they'd be done complaining. They'd be done backbiting. They'd be done feeling sorry for themselves. Because they'd realize they're living this one little gift called life. One little window. Here today. Gone tomorrow. One day faith says you're going to stand before the king. And answer for this one little gift called life. Ain't time to dread it. Ain't time to bail out. Ain't time to complain. It's time to grow up into him in all things. And shine baby. It's time to walk in the light. As he's in the light. It's not time to have issues. It's not time to be in unforgiveness. It never was. It's time to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Are you with me? Come on, you never saw Jesus bail out. You never saw him drop the cross and complain. You never saw him say, I had enough. This is it. This is too crazy. This is unfair. Father, sorry, forgive me, but I can't take it anymore. I mean, look what they've done to me. Look how bad they've beat me and hit me for doing nothing but good. I've been thinking, Lord, this is crazy. That I'm going to die on this cross and they want to do this to me. I heal all their sick and they want to do this to me. They want to leave Barabbas go. Barabbas killed a man. I raised the dead. He causes conspiracy. I'm trying to make peace and they want to kill me. These people are whacked and I ain't dying for none of them. Now here's the problem. We stereotype Jesus and we think, well, he can't talk like that because he's the Lord. He can't talk like that because he's love. And the only reason he's there in a man's body is because he's love. And the people he's dying for don't deserve a thing. They were created for a thing. It's not that they deserve a thing. They were created for a thing. And love won't fail and let go of what they were created for no matter what they've been. Ain't that something? So he would put himself in the womb of a woman and he would raise up. Think of this. He didn't even start ministry till he was 30. So he had to just live as a man 30 years on the earth by man's timetable. Submit himself to live in a man's body. He was the son of God. He was from the beginning. He always was with the father. And now for 30 years, he's just living as a man waiting for the day. You tell me he doesn't think a lot of us. You try to convince me right now that he doesn't just love to love me. See, that wigs people out that are religious. They don't understand. They've been around the tradition of church so long that they miss the heart of God along the way. See, what changes my life is the love of God. Nobody loves God first. Let's get this straight. It's the book of John. Nobody loves God first. You see his first love. And if that isn't made clear, you're not seeing it, then you feel indebted because you believe the cross. You feel indebted and get reduced to serving him instead of invited in to know him. Are you with me? That's a low level relationship serving him without knowing him. The old covenant that was called a concubine, not a bride. Yeah. And every once in a while, Those concubines brushed against the glory of the king. So you have a testimony from six years ago, from eight months ago. Your hair stood up in worship and God was there and you want that again. And you serve him all along the way hoping that happens again. That's a concubine. It's not real intimate. You wake up every day his. Come on, I'm a guy talking this way. It's not some weird thing. It's spiritual. I wake up his. I wake up a bride. I wake up one with him. One with the Father through the Son. You get it? He loves me. When I was yet a sinner, he sent his Son. 
It was his initiative. He's the one that rolled the ball on this thing. People don't get mad at the preaching of the gospel in a self-righteous way. He's the one that forgave all our sins. He's the one that paid the price and sees us holy. Colossians 1.21. Holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. That's his doing. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. You try to preach that in a lot of churches, they think it's heresy. It's Colossians 1. God's not a heretic. You with me? Sorry, I'm so excited about this. It just has had my motor running for a long time. And I do way better with the zeal. I, you don't think I'm calmed down. I'm very calmed down. No, I am. I'm communicating. I'm not talking in circles. You can hear what I'm saying. Making sense to your heart, too. Yes, I'm excited. I might look too excited to you. Trust me, I'm way more on the inside. I'm doing you a favor. Come on, we were born in Adam. That little rant I did of Jesus throwing down the cross and yelling at God, it can't happen, can it? You don't have that chapter in your Bible. He never did that because he's love. Not because he's Jesus, because he's love. If you say, well, that was Jesus, you're going to miss the whole point. Then you can't follow anything because he's God. But if that was Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, then you can follow that. And if Jesus said, follow me, He must want you to see that. If he called himself the son of man, he must want you to see that. Come on, we're not doing the deity of God injustice when we talk about Jesus coming as a man. A lot of people say, yeah, but he was 100% God. And we want to fight. And nobody's saying anything wrong. Jesus said he was the son of man. Paul said there's one mediator between God and man, and it's the man. He didn't say the God. He said the man. He's still making him a man, but he's God. And he's the name above every name. And he's the Lord of all. But he's still a man. He rose from the dead and said, don't be afraid. Touch me. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and blood as me. What's he trying to say? I'm still a man. I still have a body. I'm going to go into the holy tabernacle with a body. And I'm going to sit at the right hand with my blood on the mercy seat. And I'm going to mediate on behalf of all men. (laughs) That one truth right there is why the spirit of God is inside of me. And I like it. And he empowers me to see people for who they are, to love people and not to give up on people and not to judge people and not to be critical and nitpicky. Yeah, because everybody I ever lays eyes on now, I understand is worth the blood and they all have destiny, his image. Zero racism in my life. Zero prejudice in my life. Zero. Yeah. Yeah? I bet you Jesus lived that way. He said, follow me. He said, the things I do, you'll do if you believe. My question is, what do you believe? A deeper question is, what do you understand or what do you misunderstand? Because if what you're believing isn't producing life, you ought to reevaluate and relook at things. If you're just letting people eat away at you, if you've just got this theology that says, well, you got to understand, I got a lot on my plate, brother. My days are long, and sometimes, you know, we all have our moments. When are you ever going to challenge that language? Wonder if Jesus had his moments. Then I guess he wouldn't be rightly representing the Father. Because if the Father had his moments, we'd have all pushed him to one. Come on. Come on. Who's just walked flawlessly in this room? Who's ever followed every one of their convictions? Who's had convictions you knew to do right and for whatever reason you didn't do right? And then the conviction came back and you still didn't do right. Anybody in your life? Wonder if God was like us and said, well, that's it. Now I know where they stand. No wonder I wrote, don't put your trust in flesh. They're so untrustable. They say they love you. They just want you to bless them. They just want you to make their car run good. They just want you to give them a good job. They treat me like I'm their genie in a bottle. They don't love me. They just want me to do good things for them. I think the devil was right when he told me that about Job. Man, I'll tell you what, these people. Come on. That would be ludicrous. It, that's not who we know God to be. God is love. So on my darkest day, on my darkest day, on your darkest day, he never lost sight of what you're created to be. 
on your most willful adventure. Or your most, your most belligerent, hard-headed, willful adventure. He said, that ain't you. I know way better of you. I know your purpose, your potential, your destiny. I know who you are made to be in me. And he's got blood speaking and crying out better things the whole time you're living in rebellion. And where sin is abounding, grace is coming greater to rescue you, not judge you, save you. Why is that so hard to understand? That's not. The only reason it's hard to understand is because we've never been afforded that by people. We've been stereotyped by people. But God, in a sense, has stereotyped us from the beginning. He knows what we're here for, and he never changed his mind through time. Because love has never failed. Why? Because love doesn't seek its own. It takes no account of the wrong done to it. So God doesn't have a checklist of all the wrongs you've done to him. He knows what he created you for, and his love comes. To set you free. To triumph over judgment. Mercy. Triumph over judgment. Love. Cover a multitude of sin. Why? To get you out. To get you clean. And to get his life back inside of you. Every one of us in this room. I said it earlier. I just didn't finish this statement I'm going to make. We were all born into Adam. You can read it in Romans 5. And you must be born again. In that birth, you can't bring in old motives. You can't bring in old mindsets. You can't in bring in the old way you saw yourself. It's everything's new, guys. Man, I wish we'd teach this every time people got born again. We just make it a quick prayer to go to heaven. The whole goal is going to heaven instead of transformation. Instead of heaven coming back into us. You're not praying a sinner's prayer to go to heaven. You're getting right with God. So his spirit can live inside of you. So you can walk in the light as he's in the light. So you can love one another. Not be frustrated with one another. Not use each other as an excuse for wherever it is you are. Come on. People say, well, I wouldn't be this way if it wasn't for. I wonder if Jesus tried to pull that on us. I wonder if Jesus allowed men to decide who and how he was. He couldn't do that. He's love. Come on, I've pastored for a while. I've learned that a lot of people are letting one thing, one situation, and one person decide who they are and how they are, and that person's never Jesus. But then we'll sing He's Lord in church because it's in the song. But what's really governing your life is your view of yourself and others, and people owe you, and people failed you, and people broke your trust, and next thing you know, you have a justification for your life. And there's no hope for change because you're looking through that eye. Come on, that's not too harsh. I determined a long time ago, there's no one person going to decide who I am and how I am. Unless it's Jesus. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to pick up my cross. What's that mean? It means you never let sin against you. Give the right to produce sin in you. You never repay evil for evil. You overcome evil with good. You don't backbite and you don't bash and you don't talk about all the bad things people did to you to make an excuse so people sympathize with you and now you have a reason to be hurt. No, you get up and you walk in love and you understand if those people knew who they were, they wouldn't say what they're saying or do what they're doing and instead of being frustrated by them, you should have compassion on them because if they really knew the truth, they wouldn't be living that way and that should matter to you. Let me give you scriptural background for that. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. No, not what they do. They're having secret meetings and paying 30 pieces of silver. And some of them say that in Scripture they believed and just didn't want to be heckled by men. So they just stuffed their belief. And their standard creed looks to me like they knew what they were doing. What Jesus is saying is they couldn't have really saw. Because if they really saw, they wouldn't be living where they're living. And that's good enough for love. <laughs> he did something. I want to learn from him. He said, if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, heavy laden, heavy laden, come unto me. He said, I'll give you rest. He said, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He said, take of me, eat of me. He said, learn of me. He's the truth. He's not a good idea. He's the truth. And he makes men free. So where are we even going tonight with this? What are we even trying to say? I'm trying to say he thinks a whole lot of us and that's not heresy. He would have never did what he did and paid the price that he did as a man 
that cost him all that time and all that persecution. Do you realize that he knew? He already told the disciples he was going to be turned over to the hands of sinful men and be unjustly killed and crucified. He already knew it. Do you, do you know that he already knew his disciples were going to betray him and run and that nobody was going to stand their ground? Come on, that's called hurt in ministry. We have camps to send those pastors to when that happens. Because we don't understand the gospel, we just understand pain. Wonder if we understood the gospel and no man owed me a thing. Wonder if every day I woke up, nobody owes me a thing because I'm not going to give the power of my disposition in my day to any human being. I'm going to give it to the living God. Wonder if nobody owes me a thing. Wonder if my own spouse doesn't owe me a thing and I threw the psychology of it out the door when I got born again. This 50-50 and a lot of work and give and take and you do for me and I'll do for you. Are you kidding me? How about just waking up, I love you and modeling Jesus no matter what. Sounds like that's what he did for us. We ought to do that for others. <laughs> Come on, did you ever have the power to change Jesus? No? That's why he has the power to change us. Come on, if we had the power to change him, then he doesn't have the power to change us. So we will learn who he is and stop giving people the power to change us and let him be the one that changes us. Did he ever change his mind about men? Have men ever been able to break his heart? Come on. He could have been hanging on that cross if he was just a man with the mentality of man. He could have been hanging there crying some sad song, guys. Instead, he's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He could have been crying out, are you kidding me, people? You tell me where I've wronged you. I healed so many of you. I fed your stomachs. I've cleansed your lepers. I've raised several of your dead. And you're killing me? Are you people nuts? I'm living water. I came from heaven. Read the scripture. I'm your Messiah. And you want to reject me and mistreat me? Are you kidding me? I've proved again and again and again through my life. Who I am. He didn't say none of that, did he? Like a lamb to the slaughter without a word. Gave his life. It was so important for him to do it. Why? Because he was fulfilling what man failed. And he was becoming like us. So we could be transformed. Back to sons and daughters again. And Ephesians 1 says you were predestined into adoption as sons and and daughters. Please see yourself more than forgiven. Please see yourself more than as signed up and registered for heaven. Please see yourself as sons and daughters. A life in the spirit of God on the inside of you. The capacity to walk in love like he loved. You know what uh, Ephesians 5 says? Be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love just as Jesus loved. And gave himself up. See how you do it? What did Jesus say in Matthew 16? If any man come after me, let him deny him. Now, I'm not the sharpest man, that's for sure. I'm not a politician either, and I don't have all the answers. But I believe I'm right on this one. The biggest problem on the earth is in the things we make it. And it's not the presidency, and it's, it's not the racism thing. It's not ISIS. The biggest problem on the earth is that every day, men wake up and live for themselves when they were made for God's image. Every day, people go to church and they're Christians for themselves. And they prove it by being discouraged, hurt, and in unforgiveness, proclaiming the Lord. Come on, I'm not being mean, I'm just being straight. Don't be condemned, be inspired by what I'm saying. And if the shoe fits, throw it off and don't be Cinderella. <laughs> Kick the thing off. Come on. It's good if somebody come and just talk straight like this now and then. Because I'm leaving soon. <laughs> I'm getting out of Dodge, baby. <laughs> no. Are you hearing me, though? Yes. Come on. We prove, many of us prove by our lives that we're Christians for our own sake. Instead of his great name. Now, you be straight with me and let me talk to you just for another minute or so. Just think how it would change our life, our responses, and our actions in life. How we handle others if the truth about our motive was we were Christians for his namesake. If you're just a Christian for your well-being, 
your responses will have a whole mixed bag of stuff. But you're a Christian for his namesake. If you really denied yourself and picked up your cross and you're really following him and you're a Christian for the glory of God and the sake of others, how would that challenge your responses? How would that keep conviction fresh in your life? I wonder if you stayed alone with God and talked to him about that and prayed and asked Holy Spirit every day to empower you to live for his namesake. In Ezekiel, he cried out. He said, you know what? I picked this nation of people called Israel out of the earth and I marked them as a holy nation and they dispersed and went all over the nations and everywhere they went, they profaned and misrepresented my name and lived as if they didn't know me. The word profane means godless. They lived godless among the people. Meaning same attitudes, same covetous desires, same idolatries, same mindsets. He said, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to gather them all back, Pastor Robert. I'm going to bring them all back together. I'm going to put a new heart in them, take out the heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh. I'm going to put a new spirit in them. He said, I'm not going to do it for their sake, but I'm going to do it for my great name. If you're made for God's image, and that's your purpose for being alive, if you're alive For his image. If that's the reason he made man. He didn't make man to earn a good living. If you're earning a good living, great. But make sure you're pursuing his image. The reason man's on the earth is let us make man in our image. And in the likeness and image of God, he made them both male and female. Women, you're not losing or lacking anything on us men. You're not here to scratch our itch and you're not here to just serve us. You're here to shine and model His image as women of God. That's your first created value found in the Bible. The reason you make man complete is because you're an avenue of expression of love to multiply the same thing. Without the woman, there's no multiplication of the image. Are you with me? It's right in your Bible, male and female, both made for his image and his likeness. The number one reason a human being is on the earth is for his image. Say that again. Well, it's real simple. He made Adam and he gave him dominion and put everything that he is in Adam and he breathed into Adam and man became a living being. He gave him authority and dominion to rule the earth, to subdue it and not be subdued by it. Is that in your Bible? And then he looked around, there's animals, and they all have a partner that's comparable, meaning they can all reproduce and multiply. He's not just talking about Adam and Eve getting it on and having a bunch of kids. He's talking about him multiplying who he created him to be. Here's how you know it's true. The woman wasn't another lump of clay. He reached in to the fullness of God in the man. He said, it's not good that man be alone. Why? Because he's lonely? Cut me a break. He's filled with the fullness of God. Come on. Ephesians 3 says, above all, to know the love of Jesus Christ, right? The height, the depth, the width, the breadth. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That means to know which passes knowledge is to be filled with all the fullness of God. I looked that word up. It means a house with no empty rooms. It means a town with no empty houses. It means a ship so full of cargo, there's no room to place another box. What's that mean? Over every person's life, there's a no vacancy sign flashing in Christ because you're fully and completely occupied and fulfilled. Doesn't vulnerability drive people? Don't people do things they regret because of vulnerability and emotional weakness? Don't people get played emotionally? Don't women live by their feelings sometimes and cross lines? Don't men learn to take advantage of that? Aren't people connecting, just licking wounds, calling in love? Be real with me. Wasn't that way from the beginning. That's the twist. That's the fall of man. You show me any life that's come out of any of those scenarios. You show anybody that's blessed and producing life and multiplying Christ that's living in any of those arenas. They're in survival mode and they're trying to get by. They're trying to feed the deepest needs of their life. And there's only one way. You can only know yourself through him. Period. So he looks at man and he says, man, this dude is chock full of me. This guy looks just like me. 
He doesn't make another lump of clay. He reaches right into the fullness of God in the man. And he takes what was one and makes it two. So two can be one. And in that place, come together, be fruitful and multiply till the whole earth is filled with his glory. That's where relationship began. It wasn't one night stand. It wasn't chat rooms. It wasn't lonely sitting in a bar trying to connect. It wasn't being hurt by your spouse so you get talking to somebody else that says what they're not saying and buying in. Hello? That's a Hollywood soap opera. It can never be love. It's never love. It's always deception. And it's always emotionally driven. Never be love. It's a self-centered person that doesn't realize most of the time that it's self-centered. We just think it's normal. Well, he wasn't there for me. Well, she wasn't. Well, no wonder I, they didn't. Well, for five months, I just, well, sooner or later, you got to get tired and break. I mean, I just, well, where was Jesus all that time? See, because in Christ, there's, that's, there's never your option. When I'm a pastor, okay, so when I find out that somebody cheated on somebody, the first sign it is, without judging anybody, their life judges them. The word judge means to presume upon. Let's just look at two young people tonight, and you see them sitting together, and I think, well, oh, but they're doing it. That's judgment. You're not supposed to do that. But if a couple comes and tells me their situation, and then I start talking about it, they can't say, well, you ain't supposed to judge us. I'm not judging you. I'm talking about a real situation that's a problem that's hurting your life, and you already told me it's true. I'm not judging anybody. Stop. <laughs> Hello? Do you ever hear anybody do that? They hide behind, well, you're not supposed to judge me? I'm not judging you. I'm trying to tell you you're more than that. So let's just talk about it and get it straight, right? But when I find out that a spouse cheated on a spouse, it reveals that that spouse is lacking a spiritual relationship with Jesus or they would never have the capacity to cheat. So is the real issue the other spouse? No, the real issue is what you're lacking in Christ because here's what you're getting tricked into. As much as you say you hate your spouse now and that's why you did that, you're letting your spouse dictate your life and the thing you are is because of them. So they're fashioning you. They're your potter, but he's the great potter. The clay shouldn't be yielded to the lie. People do things because they're angry. People do things because they're frustrated. People do things because they're disheartened and discouraged. Everything has children. But God's none of those things. Ain't that something? See, this is so powerful what I'm telling you. If you'll get a hold of this. I've been living this way for 25 years. It's why I'm so passionate and aggressive with my speech. Because I'm either a real twisted man and I'm living off your temporal. Hmm. Or I live this way. Time will tell. You just see me for a weekend. Time will tell. One day we'll all find out. Yay. (laughs) Come on. Don't tell me it's not possible to wake up and not live for your life and yourself. That's not possible to wake up and live for his great name and his image and live for the sake of others. It's what Jesus made us for, his image, and his image is love. As soon as Adam falls, he's separated from love. He's in need of love. He's separated from love. Now he's in need of love. A minute ago, he's joined with love, and he is love. He's subduing the earth. Don't eat the tree. The day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. Did he fall over dead? Then what died? The image. The relationship. The connection. And you must be born And every man since that image died was born into Adam and what Adam became. Everybody in this room born into Adam, taught by the world, the wisdom of the world, the spirit of this age. Taught by the lies of life, not the giver. You with me? That's why you're not conformed to the world anymore. You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why you come out of darkness and into the light. That's why you come out from them and be ye separate. You're in the world. You're not of the world. That's what all these scriptures mean. You've been sanctified and set apart. You've been put into a higher wisdom. The wisdom of God. It says in Corinthians 1, Christ Jesus has become the wisdom of God for us. You with me? 
Come on, if he didn't teach us, we never learned it. Did he teach you to be frustrated? Did he teach you to be in unforgiveness? Did he teach you to tit for tat? And he said, she said, well, I wouldn't if they didn't. Well, how come they always, well, they make me so mad. Did he teach us any of that? Then where'd we learn it? And why are we so sure it's so right to give ourselves to it all the time? If I can't find it in him, I don't ever want to see it in me. And you're the steward of your own heart. The just live by faith. It's time to man up, guys, and say, you know what? I'm going to be a believer rather than a feeler. Ladies, I'm going to be a believer rather than emotional. People say, well, God gave us emotions, not the ones you grew up with. No, 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 no. Adam gave you those emotions. You know how I know it's right? They all spring out of a self-centered wellspring. You take away selfishness and the human being looks totally different. You think Jesus isn't on this thing and and the truth? He says, if you're going to follow me, there's one thing you have to do. If you're going to follow me, deny yourself. Why? It's busting everything up. Yourself, living for yourself when you're made for my image is the problem of your life. It's not your neighbor, your spouse, or your boss. It's you living for you when you're made for my image. And if you don't deny yourself, you'll never pick up your cross. You'll let sins against you give the right to produce sin in you. You'll feel sorry for yourself and you'll surround yourself with people that sympathize and they'll be your friends in that season. And then nobody's ever changed. They're just justified in their own mind. But no fruit to the king. And in this the father's well pleased that you bear much fruit. And that your fruit remain. Well, if you and I don't let the gospel give us a different motive in life, how's our fruit ever going to change? If we don't wake up for a different reason, if we don't wake up to shine, how are we ever going to shine? Let your light so shine before men so they see your life and glorify the Father. Why? Jesus said, when you see me, you see him. Follow me. The things I do, you'll do if you believe. As he is, so are we in this world. Firstborn among many. You need any more scripture? (laughs) I can give you more. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I can give you 2 Peter 1. You have exceedingly great and precious promises by which you partake of his divine nature. Colossians 3.10. You put off the old man and you put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. 2 Corinthians 3. You look in a mirror and beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory even by the Spirit of the Lord. So I gave you like four scriptures and then I gave you like three or four more. Yeah? Yeah? Can you tell I've read that book? You know what I've done more than read this book? Believed it. It's one thing to quote it. You're not a preacher when you quote it. I guess you can proclaim it and be a preacher, I guess, technically. You were never called and anointed to just proclaim it. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. That's the whole point. And then you have something to say. Are you with me? Or we're just well studied and we're passing on our study. (laughs) And we're all intellectual Christians. And we'll be doomed. (laughs) Because knowledge puffs you up. Love edifies. And here's the raw truth. You can't let anything take the place of knowing him. You can't let your service in a church, service in a ministry, your calling and anointing. You can't let your Bible reading, your daily devotion. You can't let anything take the place of knowing him because knowing him is what changes your life. Serving in a ministry doesn't transform your life. Knowing him does. Praying a prayer to go to heaven. That's what we call eternal life. You know what Jesus called eternal life in John 17, 3? He said to know him, the only true God, to know him is eternal life. Intimacy, relationship, believing him. Watch this. He said, how do you really know him? I love that. That was an aggressive, heartfelt question. Oh, that blessed me. Oh, you can see it in him. How do I? How do I? 
<laughs> you know what that's like? That's like that little one when you don't have the bottle, but she wants it. <laughs> you, you ever saw that, right? <laughs> and you get the bottle quick, don't you? <laughs> that's what he just remembered. Hi, little beautiful. You're so sweet. Yeah, I know. Jesus makes me feel the same way all the time. All the time. Yeah. You hold on to that all the time, okay? Don't let nobody touch that. Yeah, that ain't for nobody. Yeah. <laughs> oh, when a baby lets go of her bottle of milk to smile at you, that's a compliment. <laughs> he says, how do we know him? How do you know him? You know him through the person of Holy Spirit. You get in touch and in fellowship and in communion with God. But watch this. You'll never really get to know him unless you believe and agree with how he sees you through his son. Because you won't have the confidence to be close to him and know him. That's what removes the veil. That's what, like a bride, that's what removes the veil. You're being joined to him. So you understand through the cross alone, through the cross alone, not the circumstances of life. Through the cross alone, he loves you. He's not mad at you. Doesn't matter where you've been, matter what you've done. It matters that you care now that you see where he's been and what he's done. And you understand it's there. I love you from God. And you run to him and stop running from him. Yeah? yeah? And every morning you wake up, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you that I'm your son today. Thank you that you washed me clean. That you gave me the present and things to come. You swallowed up my past. I have new life through Jesus Christ. I so appreciate you in my life. Yeah, Holy Spirit, teach me today. Man, help me to see Jesus more. Help me to see people the way you see. Thank you, I'm done complaining. I'm done being frustrated. I put off everything that used to hold me back. God, I'm becoming the man you paid for me to become. wonder if you start every day just thinking that way, driving to work, thinking that way. I uh, can't believe I'm going to work an extra hour today and it's so miserable and, and our family doesn't even have appreciate anyway and the way my wife spends money and I whack, 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 whack. Now you tell me you got those thoughts from the Lord. <laughs> Who's ever saw Jesus? Who's ever saw Jesus? I'll sit here. You can see me. Who's ever just seen Jesus in any of the chapters of your Bible just sitting on a rock at daybreak bummed out? <laughs> you don't have that chapter? What version you all got? You don't have a chapter? And then Peter comes and sits beside him, finds a little flat rock, pulls up. What's the matter, Lord? Nah, no, I'm okay. No. Lord, I never quite saw you like this. Well, you wouldn't understand, Peter. <laughs> well, talk to me. Give me a chance to understand, Lord. I love you. Well, I don't think you understand how it feels, man. To, like you have good in your heart every day. You purpose to do good. You try to do good. You're empowered from above. People are getting healed. I mean, did you see Capernaum and all of them? People? Yeah, that, yeah, it was cool. But the people, <laughs> but the people, they're like, they're sitting there trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Where's the catch? What demon do I have? I mean... God lets me hear the thoughts. I wish he didn't. Their thoughts aren't cool. And I don't know. I'm just bummed, man. And you know what's going to happen today? They're going to throng me. They're going to come to me. Why? Because they want more bread for their belly. They want more healing in their bodies. They don't want to hear a word I have to say. They just want me to serve them. And then when I serve them, they try to find what's wrong with the service. I'm just bummed, man. I think I need a break. I don't, I don't know. You guys can go wherever you want today. I'm going to hang back. I, I ain't dealing with the people. And then he turns and here comes John. No, John, not today. Just, you're not, no. No, come here. I have a better idea, John. Why do I use these silly little illustrations? Because if you can't find it in him, why is it okay in us if it's not him? If it sounds so silly putting that in him, it should sound just as silly in you if you're made for his image. If as he is, so are we in this world. And the things he does, we'll do if we believe. That's the key. What are we believing? Are we believing the words of men? Are we believing our circumstances? Are we believing feelings and emotions that are rooted in selfishness? Or are we believing a surrendered life that's the kingdom of God through the blood of Jesus Christ? What are we believing? Come on is right. Come on, if it sounds silly putting that in him, it should sound just as silly in you because you're made for his image and he's the firstborn among many brother. You with me? Come on, when you squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. 
My wife just found a big bag on sale and we have a little thing. I squeeze the oranges and I just juice is so good. And you move that setting over where it's a big hole and it ain't the little bars and it's a little, little, little. <laughs> Dude, it's good. Man, I had, I, I grabbed like three or four big old oranges. They were big oranges, man. <laughs> Filled them in this big old cup. <laughs> if that would have been apple juice, I just squeezed four big oranges. If that was apple juice, I would have spit it out as soon as it touched my lips because I know it's orange. <laughs> would have been weird, right? Why isn't it weird when you squeeze a Christian and everything but Christ comes out? I wish that would be so weird to us. I wish that would be so weird to us. I wonder if Satan has learned that we're not sure exactly why we are what we say we are. And we're not exactly sure who we are. And that we have this kind of blend and mix of something. So he's just squeezing people. Just to see what's in them, what they're made of, and what they believe, and what they understand. I wonder if he really is a Roman lion roaring around seeking who he can devour. And you resist him steadfast in the faith. That's why it's good to have somebody come along and just get crazy with you for a little. Just <laughs> and just preach like five sermons in an hour. We can't put that kind of pressure on Pastor Robert. He'll fly me in. I'll do it for him. Just for a weekend. I just Arnold Schwarzenegger of the kingdom. Or the Sylvester Stallone of the body of Christ. You come in here and just drop it, man. Boom. You act Jesus out like that, it's like, yeah, okay. But that's normal to us. We sat and talked to our friends like that and they cuddle us or sometimes they ain't so sensitive and now you're double offended because they don't even care. Who they are trying to preach to me, tell me I should get over it. I've seen them down and out enough. They had no voice in my life. And all of a sudden we don't like the messenger so we don't receive the message. We get so thin skinned we say, well, I hear what you're saying. I just don't like the way you're saying it. So you discard it. Or we say, well, they get on my nerves instead of getting new nerves. Or they get under my skin instead of getting new skin. And we always make someone or something the problem and never look to ourselves to be changed. I'll close with this. You be real honest with me. If you let tonight teach you this one thing, that from now on, every night you go to bed, you have this in your heart and you talk it out and you pray it out. And when you wake up in the morning, you actually verbalize it out and verbalize and start right here. Nobody owes me a thing today. Mercy gives me, gives, given me one more day. Mercy's given me one more day. Not to fulfill my dreams. Not to get the promotion. Not to go on the trip to Disney. Go on Disney, but make sure you shine when you go. I'm not saying it's wrong to do those things. It's not why you're on the earth. You're on the earth to shine. Mercy woke you up one more day to give you one more day to be like him. Don't miss that privilege. And don't expend it on self and flesh and deception and human wisdom. And don't believe anything that doesn't produce life. Because if he came to give you life and life more abundantly and your thought pattern's not producing life, then you're in the wrong zone. You're believing the wrong thing. Can you tell I'm genuinely encouraged? Like, I don't know anything else. Like, they could lose my luggage. They could do a lot of things on my travel day. And this is all you're going to get. Because my luggage doesn't determine me. I'm not alive to complain. I'm alive to shine in the midst of trials. It doesn't mean he's going to make everything go cookie cutter, squeaky clean for me. There's a lot of things that go wrong in life, in my life, just like in yours. And there are always opportunities to respond just like he would if he's in my shoes. And theologically, I found out that he is. <laughs> are you with me? So if all you have is a theology for him to protect you, to provide for you, and to bless you, you're probably letting life speak louder than truth and wondering where God is or what you're doing wrong. Don't you let life speak louder than truth because truth makes you free, not life. 
And sometimes people do bad things. Sometimes people make horrible mistakes. Sometimes people flat out betray you. But here's how you'll know you know him when you don't live betrayed. When you've been betrayed and you don't live betrayed, now you know you're growing. When people do things that would have broke your heart before and you don't know how to break because you have compassion and love and you hurt for them for having that capacity and you know you've lost nothing because you found everything in him. See, the only reason we're so hurt by people is because we're still finding our value and identity through people. So we're always taking it as a reflection on us. And it's a self-centered deception. But if you'll deny yourself and you'll pick up your cross and follow him, you'll find that these things change. How do you get there? Like the gentleman asked with hunger. You get there through relationship, communion. You talk these things over with God. You, you get in alone. You're driving in your car. You talk about these things. We have prayer life. Most of us have a level of a prayer life, and it's usually a needs list. Usually our prayer life is what we need God to do for us. But what about your communion life? What about just communing with him? What about just fellowshipping with the Lord? What about him just fathering you and you being his child, driving to work and just communing with him, thanking him for the gift called life, teaching you his way, a whole new and living way. Putting the attitude of heaven on the inside of you, causing you to look through his eyes, see everybody the way he sees them, to take no account of the suffered wrongs. Come on, love doesn't seek its own. Love, and it takes no account of the wrong done to it. Well, that's a pretty heavy indictment. We've been busted up by each other, haven't we? And guess what love does? It takes no account. That means it doesn't even talk about it. it. Takes no account, doesn't even see it. Why? Because it's not living for itself. What it sees is that somebody can't see who they are. Forgive them, Father, they know not what they... 1 Timothy 1.5 says the goal of our instruction is love. 1 John 2 says if he loved us this way, ought we not love one another? For he who loves his brother has no reason to stumble because of him. Ain't that something? 1 John 4, 7 and 8, it's a little children's church song we think, but it's actually scripture. It's 7 and 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loveth is born of God and knows God. He who loveth not just doesn't know God. For God is love. He didn't say you don't pastor. He didn't say you don't travel and preach. He didn't say you don't play on the worship team. He didn't say you don't go on a mission trip once a year. He didn't say you don't attend church. He didn't say you don't see your need for a Savior and then you're not going to heaven. But he did say this. If you don't love, there's one reason, not two. One, you don't know him like you could. Which means I can't know him without being so influenced by him that who he is begins to manifest in my life. That's how important this relationship is. That if you love, it's because you know him. And if you don't love, I'll have to back up. If you don't love, you just don't know him. That's not an insult. That's not a slam. That's an invite into relationship. So when you see somebody walking in love, unconditional love, not taking account of a suffer wrong, what's it evidence of? They know him. Yeah. It's not because they never miss church. You can go to church for 50 years, never miss a Sunday, get thrown into crisis and respond like the man that never went to church. You miss the whole point of why you went. And think you're just paying your dues or paying homage. No, the whole reason we're not to forsake ourselves assembling together is in order we might stir each other in love and good works. You come to get empowered and focused and sharpened so when you leave, hopefully you look just a little more like him than when you came. That's why we gather. It's not just to see what God might do for us. It's how can he make us more like him so we can walk in the light as he's in the light. You with me? Yeah. I'll take that applause as a stopping point. <laughs> the people told me to stop. No, I'm, I appreciated the applause. There's a receptivity in that. I don't need to say any more. I said plenty. I probably preached five sermons if you want to break it down. 
got a whole lot more in me. I'm never done. Just stop. It's a time thing. <laughs> I never stop preaching, man. I'm preaching to myself all the time. I preach to people. I talk to, it says every creature, I talk to a tree if I'm the only, if it's the only thing that I have. You're amazing. You are awesome. <laughs> Wind blowing tree. Go ahead and worship him. It's the goodness of God that leads men to change. It's not the reprimand or the judgment of God. I didn't come here to shout you down. I came here to cheer you on. I came here and right out of the gate, I told you that Jesus thought your life lived was worth his, him coming through the womb of a woman and dying. You coming alive was worth him dying. That he actually did the extent of what he did because he wanted to restore the value of your life, not just forgive you. That's pretty intense. Come on, does anybody pay a high price for nothing? How do you value the life of Jesus Christ? How do you put a price tag on the surrender and life of Jesus Christ? How do you put a price tag on him coming through the womb of a woman and becoming a man and he's God? And he has to become a man to come as a man. How do you put a price on all that? I'd call it selfless. I'd call it the deepest and highest expression of love, wouldn't you? He must really know what he's buying if he's going to pay that high of a price. Come on, I know us. We know each other. You're two for one, buffet, all you can eat. It's 40% off and you know in two weeks because of the season we're in, it'll be 60 and you wait. Why? Because when you write the check, you're sure what you're buying is well worth what you're paying. Any car dealers here? Any car salesmen? Don't be ashamed. You're not all crooked. <laughs> Usually they won't raise their hands because we have this society belief that they're all crooked. I don't believe that. I've met some amazing car dealers. No car dealers here? Robert, did you used to be a car? I'm glad you got saved. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I figured I'd get away with that because nobody raised their hand. Did you used to be a car salesman? Okay, so when you were a car salesman, you had the price in the window or whatever or wherever. But people never just came up and said, wow, that's a great buy. They usually tried to get you lower, tried to get you to absorb their transfer fees or their taxes and even still knock off. And they're, they're sure you got that at auction. They're sure you got that as a repossession or for practically nothing. And you're going to try to eat for a month on their purchase. That's how people think. Buying car, am I right or am I that far off? So what do they do? Keep trying to knock you down to see how low they can get you. And you have to play that game as a salesman to try to get in that zone where you're still feeding your family, but selling a car. Am I telling the truth? Okay. So when you were a car salesman, what did you do? Used cars or new cars? Used, used cars. That's, that's the one I really was hoping. <laughs> so you got the used car and it says 12.9 on the window. They Kelly Blue Book it quick. They go, whoa, this thing says 13.1. They type in all the car, the year, good condition. You got 12.9. They go, 13.1. They look and you got a little halo on your head. They think this guy's honest. Kelly Blue Books. I mean, a couple hundred more than they got in the window. They're giving me a fair buy. They don't have this marked up. Who's ever done that? And then they go, I'll tell you what, that's a good car, man. You got a good price on that. Oh, it's a very good car. Believe me. I mean, we're not making a whole lot on it. We're trying to be fair. That's why the price is on it. I know what we got it for. We're just making a couple hundred dollar commission. And well, I'll tell you what, 12, 9, 13, 1. I'll give you 14, 2. <laughs> did anybody ever do that? Nobody ever did that. Why don't they do that? Because they don't want to give what it's not. But yet he shed his blood to redeem your life. He must believe the purchase possession is well worth the price. Not worth the price, well worth the price. That's powerful, man. And see, no preacher ever told me that, but I didn't know Robert. No preacher ever told me that Jesus died on the cross to restore my value. And that the cross revealed my value, didn't just expose my sin, forgave my sin, exposed my value. That changes things. 
Because as a young man, I had no capacity to change. And I still felt like I was always just as messed up a sinner. But I believed the cross. And I'd watch crucifixion movies and I'd actually feel guilty. And after a while, it was hard to go to church because I always felt bad about myself. Who can relate to that? And you actually believed the cross. But you had no power to change. We'll talk this week about the power to change. Some people still don't believe we have the power to change. It's the cross that changes you. It's Holy Spirit. It's the working of God's power. It's called grace. You're saved by grace through faith. It's called seeing yourself in righteousness. We'll talk about it. Because I am not the same man I was before I was born again. I'm not living with a conscious awareness of sin. I'm not expecting to stumble every step of the way. I don't believe I'm sinning while I'm breathing like people taught me growing up. I actually believe I'm a sun manifesting and shining and in the making. And, and if I would stumble... I would never run from him and put on fig leaves. I run to him and get wiser, sharper, and clean in his presence because he washes me in the blood. And I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free. And I'm going to talk about that this weekend. So we're coming tomorrow morning and tomorrow night and then Sunday. So if you can come, come. because We'll talk about it. We'll probably expound a little more on how to get to know God more. Okay? You all getting something out of this? Watch this. If you leave here with this tonight, I'm on the earth to pursue his image. And that's why he came to put his image back into me. And every day I wake up, I have a higher goal. I wake up to walk in love. I wake up to model his image. I wake up to shine. And in that truth, watch, nobody owes me a thing. What would that do for your marriage if you, forget your spouse for just a quick second, just you put that on in your marriage, in your family, in your home that nobody owes you a thing. And you didn't hold anybody to any expectations. They couldn't fail or break your heart because you were blessed to be alive and you were excited to shine. It took me through an eight-year thing with my wife where I didn't even see the pain of it. Eight years, my wife was in an identity struggle with her own self. And for eight years, all I could do is love her and not get tired, weary, or broken. And for eight years, I just about lived like a married single man, if you follow my drift. Because she got so demeaned in her identity. And there was a time she was even suicidal. And I was a full-time pastor. And she wouldn't come to church. Can you see that in me? Can you tell I've been through that? (laughs) I wasn't calling nobody asking for help in prayer. Why? I'm not on the earth to be loved by her. I'm on the earth to love her. There's not a thing she can do to break my heart. Why? He fixed it. And he put the right why in it. And I live for the right reasons now. And I don't wake up to be loved by her. I wake up to be more like him. So when she's having trouble, it brings out the best in me. But if I start saying, brother, you better pray for me. If she don't change soon, I'm about to break, man. Dude can only take so much. Okay, tell me Jesus taught you that attitude. No, men taught you that attitude. Your own feelings suggest that's true. But you show me where Jesus gave up on you. You show me where Jesus let go of you. You show me where Jesus just dropped on you. Just one of you. Tell me that you actually came to Jesus and he legitimately gave you a hard time and said, oh, you're coming to me now. You should have came a long time ago. Hi, beautiful. Hi. You're so precious. See, nobody had that experience. We came to him and he washed us clean as if we never failed. There was no long discussion, and I'll get back to you tomorrow and see where we stand. I'll go have a board meeting with the 24 elders and deliberate, and I'll be in touch in the morning. (laughs) Come on, man. Eight years my wife lived like that. Would you say she was in trouble? Would you say she really needed a revelation of Jesus? Guess where he lives? In me. (laughs) So now ain't the time to be a frustrated, discouraged husband. A statistic on the earth. With an alibi or a justification. Now it's time to be like him. Because that's why he's in me. To love her in her most trying time. It fascinates me that when people cheat on each other, the only thing we focus on is how hurt the person is that's cheated on. We don't even have the ability to hurt for the person cheating, especially when they were Christians, because we don't even realize how lost they must be, how confused they must be, how hard they must be. Something is really wrong if you're sleeping around and you're married. 
But all we can do is hurt for the person cheated on and almost resent the person that cheated. And the person that cheated is the one in trouble and the person cheated on doesn't have a problem if they keep their life right in Christ. They just got to walk through some real things. But in the long run, they don't have a problem. Their spouse is in great trouble. It's amazing how hard it is to preach that in the church. Because we think and feel and hurt for ourselves all the time and think it's normal. And if Jesus lived that way, he'd have never put himself in Mary. He'd have been sitting up there crying because of us. Waiting for us to make up for it. He said, nope, I'll take it in my own hands and I'll make up for it. That's the Jesus that we love, guys. And that's the one that gave his life. Y'all good? Okay, I'm done. I know you don't believe me. I don't even believe me. It's 8.30. I'm being so easy on you guys. Flew the whole way over here for an 8.30 service? I don't think so. I got to milk this out a little. Can we, do, can we do something though? Can we do something quick? I didn't talk about this much, but really, New Life Through Jesus covers it. Forgiven covers it if your sins are forgiven. Can we, just, can we do this a certain way? Can we just pray for the sick without taking a super crazy long time and actually see what God's doing in the room? Can we do that? Would y'all like that? Would that be fun? If we like pray for the sick and then actually see what God's doing rather than just pray and everybody go home, but we actually see what God's doing. Would you like that? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for the sick real quick. We won't be super long with this, but pay attention, okay? Because I want you to help and participate. And if we came this far, don't back out on me now, okay? Don't say, oh, that healing thing. I ain't sure about that. Well, now would be a good time to participate. And just hang in there. Don't get up and leave. If you leave, I'm calling you at the door. I'm going to pray the door doesn't open. You go back there and boom and bang your head on the door because it didn't open. You better sit down. (laughs) That's your cue. Here's the deal. When you pray for the sick, actually these signs shall follow those that. He's not talking about the disciples. He's not talking about the apostles. He's talking about believers. He said in Matthew 28, didn't he tell them these things to go pray and, and, and minister these things, right? Didn't he tell them in Matthew 28 to teach these things and teach every man? Go make disciples of every nation and teach them to observe everything I taught you. So if he's talking to them, is he talking to us? It's where we make a grave mistake in the church. We say, well, that was the apostles. No, believers. These signs shall follow those that believe. believe. If you look in the context of Mark, what he's saying is those that believe through your message. They're supposed to go and preach, and those that believe through your message, these signs will follow those that believe. They will lay their hands on the sick, and the sick will recover, right? There's other signs, too. That's the last one. First one is they'll, uh, they'll speak in new tongues. They'll cast out devils. I mean, you start looking at the list. It's things that have thrown a monkey wretch in the church. You talk about praying in tongues, people are like, wow! And you talk about casting out devils, like, what devils? What? Freaky. That's, are you mean you're trying to say possessed? I mean, the things Jesus said are the basic signs of believers are freak out mode for a lot of churches. Okay. So here's the deal. I've learned this over the years. This is just experience. I've learned this over the years. The number one, I'd say, I dare say this in your house. The number one reason... People don't pray for the sick. It isn't because they don't believe. It's because they're afraid nothing will happen. They're afraid nothing will happen. Hey, yeah. And because they're afraid nothing will happen, guess what they do? They don't lay their hands on the sick, so guess what they always have? Nothing. The very thing they fear. It's a paradox. Wouldn't you say self-centeredness is hinged to that? And how they'll feel and what they'll look like? And I I know some people, well, I just don't want to misrepresent him. Not loving people and praying for the sick is misrepresenting him. Because it's a sign of a believer. Look, if love never fails, I don't want to fail to love. Are you with me? So here's the deal. When you pray for the sick, it's real simple. It's not your prayer. Be honest with me. Help me with this. I've learned this too. Who in here has prayed for the sick before? Okay, good. Wow, that's a majority, major majority. That's exciting. That's refreshing. Now watch this. So I have, I'll have good class participation. You'll, you'll uncomfortably chuckle when I say this. I promise you. 
Who realized when they prayed for the sick, and you're thinking about it as I'm saying it, when we go to pray for the sick, we're more conscious about what we pray, how we pray, and what we say than the finished work of Christ and God's love for the person. It becomes more about us and how we're praying. We're trying to pray right and powerful and effective, and we become self-conscious as soon as we start praying for the sick a lot of the times. You all get that? Okay. So that's a good way for nothing to ever happen. And, and, and that's a good thing to never, ever do again. Okay? Okay. So it's not about your long prayer. It's not about emphasizing the name of Jesus. Jesus. You know, it's not about trying to hit the right tone or wave the right color flag or hit the right note on the shofar, you know. (laughs) Jesus, whoa! It's not that. It's his finished work. It is finished. So there's something we have to see through the cross that he died to forgive our sins. He shed his blood. Right? He was, he was raised from the dead for our justification. It says, don't forget his benefits. He forgives all of our sin. He heals all our disease. Now, just because we prayed for people and haven't seen them healed, doesn't mean you have the right to change what his word says. We need to let what his word says keep changing us. Some of us, I'm not being smart, I'll look up. I'm not talking to anybody, I'm just making a statement. Some of us have a hard time maintaining a healthy attitude. But we think because we read a technical scripture, we should apply it, ta-da, and it works. It's not a technical scripture, it's a revelation. It's something you see, not something you say. Are you with me? We just sometimes, some of us have a hard time maintaining a healthy attitude. But we, we say, well, I prayed for them and they weren't healed and this and that. And, and we're having a hard time just living our life productive sometimes in areas. And then we get discouraged with scripture and we turn this into a book of, of principles. Instead of a revelation of relationship and intimacy and love. Faith worketh through love. You don't read the Bible and throw this thing in your tool belt and say, okay, I say this, say this, and he does this. I've seen countless Christians give up and get disappointed. Well, I went out and I prayed and God didn't do nothing. If he ain't showing up, I ain't showing up. I've met tons of Christians talk like that. I walked into a subway with a guy that used to pastor through pastoring aside because he went out on the streets and never saw any healings. And we're just talking and I asked if he'd do lunch with me. I didn't even know him. He got nervous. I was at a conference. He didn't even, doesn't even do church anymore. He kept feeling like God said, go to the conference, go to the conference, go to the conference. He's sitting way in the back. I just noticed him. It was a God thing. I'm preaching. I noticed him. At the end, I told the, the leader, don't hook me up with anybody. There's a guy I want to go to lunch with. I went back and I said, hey, buddy, what's your name? He told me his name. He looked nervous. I said, can we do lunch? I, I bowed out of what they all wanted me to go to lunch with certain people, but I felt drawn to you. I want to go to lunch with you. He's nervous. Okay. He's backslidden. But he's hungry. Who knows his heart's good down on the inside? Who knows he's just deceived and confused? And who knows he's not evil? He's just deceived. We go to lunch. We're talking. He's telling me his whole story. I know you find this hard to believe. I'm a great listener. I don't say a word. I just you let people talk. Oh, I'm a great listener. I actually believe I'm a better listener than a talker. Because people expose and reveal what they believe and where their heart is and where they're located. When they talk, I just let them talk. I just listened the whole way to Subway. I asked if we could do Subway. We went into Subway. So I'm getting my great sandwich made. It was awesome. They're just making my sandwich. Subway is awesome. I think there's going to be Subways at the marriage feast of the Lamb. <laughs> He's behind me. Girls making my, my sandwich. And I looked at her and I said, honey, I never said anything to this guy. I just heard his whole story. And he talked to me about how he went on the streets and how he used to pass. I said, really? You don't pass anymore? No. Well, it's because he tells me this. I mean, it was a terrible, sad story. So we're at Subway, and I'm like, wow. And I said, well, we got to get our sandwiches. We can talk at the table. I, get, I look at this lady, and I said, honey, what's going on in your neck and down into your shoulder? I said, car wreck? She went, oh, how do you know? I said, it was a couple years ago. You've been going through this for a while. She said, two, two and a half years. She said, how did you know that? I said, listen, there's only one way I could know that. I said, the Lord showed me. Now listen, right away when somebody does that, we say, whoa, they're so spiritual. <laughs> we want to make people spiritual heroes. We, we, people will come up, you tell a story like this, come up and say, 
just tell me whatever you hear. I just want to hear whatever word, whatever. And it's like, stop. It's not why I'm telling the story. Nobody has a thing unless it's given. And if, if he didn't speak, I'd hear nothing. But I actually believe he'll do that. I'm positioned for it. How many of you went into Subway thinking you'll hear stuff like that for people? Sometimes it's the farthest thing from our mind. And sometimes you get little impressions and discount them as something else. You might find the whole time it was God speaking. He just gave me that little bloop. And I said, listen, honey. I said, it hurts you right now. She said, oh, it's, it's virtually like... Messed up vertebrae, it's kind of a pinched nerve. It's always there. It's bad. I said, honey, it gets way better than just hearing it. Give me your hand. She reached over and we prayed. And I always say to people, you're going to love this. I said, give me your hand. You're going to love this. And she's like, <laughs> real simple. Father, thank you for your amazing love for her. Wholeness in Jesus' name. No more pain. Three seconds. She's making sandwiches. There's a line. It's not time to pray for a half hour. Or preach for 15 or 20 minutes or like. <laughs> There's a time for everything under the sun. You came for this. There wasn't time in the subway. <laughs> she goes. What? Oh, it's her body. Who knows she knows? It's the most beautiful thing. I've seen it so much. Just cry and oh. oh what? I said, listen, there's a reason. I just shared Jesus with her. Pastor, I wasn't even, I forgot about him. I'm locked, right? She says, can you, can you do the same thing for my friend? I said, I, what, what about, she said, let me get her. She ran, she said, hey, she pulled her out of the little kitchen thing and pulled her out. I'm not saying this for any bad reason. I just saw it. You could not see it. She had her whole neck was a tattoo of a spider web. And she had a black widow on her Adam's apple. And it's a statement of something, right? And I'm, it wasn't like, Jesus. <laughs> and I'm not like, oh, that girl, no wonder she has pain in her body, just serving up the devil. <laughs> no, it's just a reflection of what she's going through, how she feels, how she takes, whatever. And she's trying to make a statement. She's got her whole neck tattooed. She's got pain in every joint of her body. She's so young. And the girl's telling me her stuff. And I said, you got pain right now? She looked at me and wept. She said, no, you got to let this man pray for you. You know how my neck and how I was? It's, I'm telling you, for real, this girl's already getting touched by Jesus. I don't even say a thing. She's already emotional. I got her hand and I prayed. She sobbed and she sobbed and she sobbed as every pain came out of her body standing in the subway. So I got my sandwich. I paid for pastor's sandwich. I ran over and sat down. He came in behind me and sat down because there was people coming. The young black man comes out, tall, thin guy. He's going to ring me up. I said, hey, buddy. He said, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. He backed up. He said, I'm fine, man. I'm fine. I said, okay, good, good. Go on. He didn't want a fist bump. Man. You don't know why people do things like they do, but it was just funny. So I went and sat down. Pastor sits down. I look up to talk to him. Guess what pastor's doing? He said, you know, I went out and I took the scripture on the streets, but I never took love. It was like I was testing God and holding to his word. I didn't even have compassion for people. He said, I watched love pour out of you for those girls like they were your own girls. I could see the love. I could feel the love. It was like you knew them. You loved them. I could tell how much you cared for those girls. He said, I went and did all these principles and I never took love. He said, man, I've been deceived. I said, you've been deceived for a long time. Welcome home. And we just chatted. And as soon as the line ended, guess what the girls did? <laughs> Dove right in at our table. And we just... Pray and fire. Ah, oh, we just had fun. <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> they came right to the table. Why? Because they found life in the message. They found life in Jesus. Ain't that cool? Not a sermon. We're not doing a service. We weren't in a conference. We we're just getting a sandwich. These signs follow those that. But you got to carry a belief in your heart. If you're going to be conscious of these things when you're out there. So here's the deal. We're going to do it now. And I took a long time to get here. We're still before nine o'clock though. 
When you pray for people, you'll find two things. A lot of different ailments, a lot of different sicknesses and challenges, but you'll find two situations. You'll find a situation where if people were healed, they wouldn't necessarily know it in the time because it's something that comes and goes. You're in a grocery store line and they're talking about a migraine that hits them once every six, seven days and they're in the sixth day and they thought it was going to hit them today and they're glad it isn't here, but they're expecting it tomorrow. Do you ever hear anybody talk like that? That's where you speak right up. Come on, the worst they could probably do is say no, right, when you ask for prayer. I mean, I guess they could pull a 9 millimeter out and shoot you, and you're still not going to die, so just be okay. But they're probably not going to shoot you. Probably not. They're probably going to say, no, thank you. That's not so hard to take. Can I just pray for you? No. Oh! <laughs> and then you fall over and die spiritually. Are you kidding me? <laughs> People say no to Jesus every day, and he's okay. He loves them. He knocks on the door sometimes every day. Nobody answers like nobody's home, and they're there the whole time. And he just keeps knocking, because that's what love does. So the worst they can do is probably say no thank you. But I ask them, please don't say no. I'm a little aggressive sometimes. I'll say, listen, I wasn't eavesdropping. I couldn't help but to hear what you said about the headache. That has to be terrible. Oh, and they're quick to tell you how horrible it is and how often. And they're quick to tell you the details, right? Well, listen, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to make much of this. And I ain't selling you a thing. Man, it's ripping my heart when I hear that. I, please give me the honor of praying for you and believe. What? You want to pray? Shh, it's okay. I'm not trying to make a scene. Honey, if I didn't see this stuff happen, I wouldn't be asking you. I'm not winging it and I'm not taking a shot at it. That's where I'm at now with people when I talk to them. I say, if I knew nothing was going to happen, I'd be a fool to ask. I'm asking because I believe he can change it and he'll never come back. Would you let me pray? Please don't say no. By then they see you're serious and even if they don't believe, they usually say, okay. <laughs> and that's where you want to make sure you only pray for about four, five, six seconds, no more. Because you're, not, you're there to bless them, not freak them out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Father, I thank you for your amazing love for her. My grant you leave her, you'd never, ever come back. In the authority of Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your love. And you look at him and say, yeah, I know that seems simple, but honey, it wasn't simple. Jesus paid an incredible price to make what we just did possible. What happens when you leave there and the thing doesn't come back? What happens if it doesn't come back in a week, two, four? That's going to work on her, ain't it? You say, well, wonder if it does come back. Well, you've lost nothing. You showed her that you care, you believe, and you're pursuing something and you love. She already wasn't expecting anything. It's not like you're trashing the gospel. Well, that God, he disappointed me. I thought I'd be healed. She's not, if she thinks you're not even totally. <laughs> but I'll tell you what people don't, don't miss, that you're genuine, you're sincere, and that you care about them. And you sow a seed of love. Wonder if, wonder if they get in the car, Ray, and they sit down, and they're thinking, and they go, man, that was weird. It's almost like, they didn't even know me, but it's almost like they cared. It's like they really loved me. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord comes on them because you sowed a seed and says, I've loved you from the beginning. And now they're having some encounter with God because you sowed a seed. You ought to be in faith for this stuff. So here's what we're going to do real quick tonight. And I know you don't believe anything's quick at this point. <laughs> I'm trying, man. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. I, I want to instruct. I want to teach. But here's what we're going to do real quick. Please participate if, if this fits your description. You're in the room, you have a situation less than wholeness. It's, it's something that comes and goes. You have to have a test. It shows up on a result, but you don't have any physical symptom or anything to, to identify that it's there, that it's not there right now, but you just have an ongoing condition or you're medicated for it or it would take a test result or it's stuff like migraines. You're following me? You have a situation in your body less than wholeness right now. And there'd be no way to test if you're healed because you wouldn't be able to know. Time would have to tell. Let me see who you are. If, if you can, stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet real quick so we know who you are. Please don't stay in your seat if you have this condition. Come on, I challenge you. Please stand up if you have something like this. Don't sit there and say, oh, this ain't real. Or Why don't you just stand up? You've got nothing to lose. Okay, stand up. Come on, if you fit this condition, stand up. If you were healed, you wouldn't know. Thanks. People are slowly getting up. I'm wait. Yeah, thank you. I'm still waiting. I heard like four or five. So I saw one, two, three. I'm just going to wait for at least two more. You just stood up? Yeah, thank you. Just waiting. Sometimes it takes a while. Thank you. Yeah, don't, let's not come this far and miss out now. 
Come on, if I didn't think anything wasn't going to happen, why would I take the time to do this? I'd have preached my amazing sermon and went back to the house. (laughs) So uh, this is good. We got everybody? Do we really? We got two more? I just keep hearing in my heart, two more. I know we had more earlier. Thank you. I got them. I'm good. Isn't that awesome? Come on. Do I have plenty of people to pray for? Why am I waiting and thinking I hear two? Because he wants everybody involved because I believe this is real and I believe it's going to make a difference. So why would you want? If I believe that, why would I want you sitting? I'm going to compel you to stand, right? Isn't that what love would do? Okay. If you're sitting near him, right beside him or right behind him, stand up and tap him. Get him to turn around. Don't pray yet. But just say, hey, I'm going to stand with you when, when we pray. So just, you don't even have to tell them what's going on. We're just going to do a simple few second prayer. Okay? The people that stood, all I want you to do is this. I want you to believe Jesus loves you and God loves you or he'd have never put Jesus on the cross. That's all I want you to believe. You say, well, you don't know what I've been through with this sickness. Listen, the sickness is not the measuring stick of God's love. The cross is. Don't get that mixed up ever. Don't let your circumstances challenge God's love. Let his love be settled through the cross or you'll never be rooted and grounded. Don't give life the ability to talk yourself out of believing he loves you. The cross says he does. So I want you to do is believe he loves you. The people praying, all I want you to do is something like this in a second or two here. Just something like this. Be made whole in Jesus' name. No more symptoms of weakness or sickness. In Jesus' name, be whole. That's all I want you to do right now. Believe that over him. Just speak that right now in Jesus' name. Be whole in Jesus' name. No more sickness. No more symptoms. Oh, here we go. This condition never returned in the authority of Jesus' name. Because you love them, Father. Amen? Amen. Okay, now you say that's too simple. No, you watch. We're going to let time tell on this one because nobody really knows, right? Because of the situation. But we're going to let time tell. And you're going to see when you leave here tonight. Wow, thank you for what you're doing in my body. Thank you, God, that you're moving in my life. Man, I'm believing that. Thank you that this thing will never return. Go ahead and don't be afraid to agree with what we believed. Amen? Grab your seats real quick. We're going to do one more thing. And this is, the, this is, to me, the funnest one. So if we just prayed for people that wouldn't know if they're healed, who's the next group? They will know, right? Okay. So that doesn't put the preacher under pressure because I can't produce a thing. I can just believe a thing and you can just believe a thing. So it's never about failing. It's always about believing. Boy, I wish we would just get that. Let's stop taking this thing so personal that we're afraid to step out because of what might not when we're closing the door to what might. Are you with me? And besides, we're in a church service. Are you kidding? We're like, this should be the easiest setting. Like Christians, we should know that we have one response. Thank you for loving me. Thanks for what you're doing in my life. Thanks for what you're doing in my body. Right? So if you have sickness in your body... A condition in your body. If you have an eye that you can't see out of. Or two eyes. You have an ear or two ears that you can't hear out of. Anything, anything in your life that's less than wholeness. You got poor stuff. You can't lift your arm. You can't, your knees are like really bad. And you can't just go up steps without a lot of inconvenience. And they're degenerate. And, and, and I challenge you now. You don't say, well, it's because I worked hard for a lot of years. I know what we're trying to say. But listen, Jesus is bigger than all those scenarios. And there's no place where Scripture doesn't cover your life, period. Are you with me? You got some less than wholeness. And if you were healed tonight, without exaggeration, because we don't want you to exaggerate, that's called lying. (laughs) Revelation 19 says, you lie, you fry. I don't want any friars here. (laughs) This is not a deep fryer tonight. This is an atmosphere for healing, not frying. I'm just having fun with y'all. <laughs> if, you would, if you would check your body, you would know you were healed. Any situation like that, no matter what it is, I need you to stand to your feet. Please, don't stay in your chair. Some people are afraid to stand sometimes because they say, I'm going to feel so bad if I'm not healed. Or I'm going to feel bad for the person that prayed for me. Don't you do that. Stand to your feet. Okay? Stand to your feet if... We're waiting on everybody that needs prayer that if you were healed, you would know it. And you could check it, and it's something in your body that's right now. It's a right now thing. You won't have to wait till tomorrow. You'll be able to check it right now. We got everybody? We good?
Thank you, buddy. How you been? You okay? Good. Good seeing you. We got everybody? I feel like somebody's holding out. It might be more than one. It might be a couple people in that, the knee thing I shared. That your knees aren't, aren't right. Like if you walked upstairs, you'd be hurting in your knees and it would bother you. And, and if you would come up here and run up and down these stairs a little, you'd be able to feel it in your knees. If, if that's you, I need you to stand. Is that where you stood? You're going to be probably the first to go, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> Is that why you stood? Did you stand because of that too, that last little word? Wow, good. Did anybody else stand because of the little knee thing? Because I was hearing it was at least like two people. Okay, good, good. Thanks for standing. Oh, you already were up though. You were already up and standing. These guys were holding out. We had to fish for them. We had to fish for them. There's one more person I'm going to call out. I don't think I'm going to hear anything else. I think this is the last thing, but I believe you're here. I wouldn't take the time with it. You feel, you feel, you don't even know what it is. You're concerned about it though. And it's been happening for a little while. You're real weak right now in your body. You have a weakness that's unnormal to your everyday life, but it's been there for a while and you just feel drained and weak. Even as you sit in your seat. Is that you? Okay. Got a couple people to stand back here, but man, when you stood that my heart jumped, that was good. I feel like God's calling people out there. Now, now watch the love of God. Watch. Did we already have plenty of people to pray for? Could we already made a ministry of this thing? But I'm listening in my heart. and I'm not in a hurry because I know the love of God. And if one little girl stands up and that concern, because it's been concerning you, you're wondering what it is, and your mind wants to go. Right? Yeah. Isn't it awesome that I described that and saw that? So I, I got quiet, and that's what I heard in my heart. Boom, and she jumped right up. And, it, and two other people jumped up behind her. But when she jumped up, I knew she was the one I was directly talking to. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so why did we do that? Where did that information come from? How do I know that? Why would the Lord hold up the thing that we're doing and show me that if this wasn't real? Yeah. Oh, you get it? Okay, now here's what you didn't know. The people sitting, this wasn't a trick, it wasn't a trap. You're going to be my prayer team. And I want you to participate. And if you're really, really dead set against it, I'm going to say challenge that and I wish you'd get up. But if you won't get up, we're not going to judge you and be mad at you. And if you say, well, I never did this before, then I really want you on my team. Because you're not going to be self-confident and you're not going to get in the way. You're going to be fear and trembling and you're going to trust Jesus or it's him or broke, right? So I actually want you on my team. If you're uncomfortable, that would be great to put you on the roster. So here's what I need quick. Don't anybody pray yet. I just want you to connect. The people standing, put your hand up so we don't lose you in the crowd. Keep your hand up until someone claims you. When you're claimed, put your hand down immediately so we know who else to get. I want one-on-one. The people sitting, go find somebody. Have fun with it. Don't pray yet. Just claim them. Say, hey, you're mine. Say, hey, I'm going to pray for you. You want to really have fun? Say, hey, I never did this before. (laughs) Or you could tell them, I prayed for 10 people and nothing ever happened. I'm picking you. (laughs) Go find your person. Come on. I think we can cover everybody. I think we had about enough sitting to cover everybody standing. I want one-on-one. If you're doubled up, go find somebody with a hand. I still got, I got a guy double over here, but I got two hands over here. Do I have anybody else available? Oh, good. Thanks for helping. Yeah, you don't have to double up. I got people coming. Is there anybody unaccounted for? Anybody that's unaccounted for? There's a man in the middle with his hand raised. Brother with a beard, can you? Oh, okay. I don't mind. The lady can go through there. The young girl can get through there. He grabbed the man. That's right. He needed somebody. You, she's coming in to get you, buddy. Jesus is on the way in her. <laughs> Amen. Look at her. You can't tell me Jesus ain't in her. Does everybody have somebody to stand with you? Okay, let's, let's move along and do this. Just a little after nine. We're not doing terrible. Take three seconds and ask them, why did you stand so you know what you're praying for? Don't pray yet. Just three seconds. Don't give them the life story. Just... You know, herniated disc, tore rotator cuff, arthritis in my knees, whatever. Just give them the three-second version. You got it? Everybody should have it. Y'all got it? All right? 
You're good. You guys are good. Bring it down. Tone it down now. We're going to move forward and do this together. This is a safe environment, man. And you notice I didn't, as good as the worship team is, I didn't bring up no music. We're not going to, this is not about atmosphere. This is about just simple truth. It's about God loving us through His Son and paying a price for redemption and healing. So I actually felt like a long time ago the Lord told me to do it this way, to teach people and make the room as dry as I can. Because we're so into atmosphere. And wonder if the atmosphere is the kingdom of God and it's at hand. Wonder if it's in you. Yeah. Wonder if you don't have a worship team on a wagon pulling them through Walmart parking lot. <laughs> wonder if you just have you in the atmosphere at Walmart. Yeah. So you all ready? You know what you're praying for? You, you, you got it, right? So here's what we're going to do. I'm literally only going to give you like six seconds to pray. That's for your sake. It's because I'm a friend. It's the truth because we get self-conscious when we pray and we it's because we're sincere. We're trying hard, but we're more focused on what we're saying and praying. And we think it's our prayer that heals. It's not our prayer. It's his finished work. So watch this. Nobody's prayer has ever healed the sick. It's their faith in what he did. And all glory goes to him. And we just get to steward that truth on the on the earth. Isn't that amazing? So there's no pressure. So you can't fail. You just believe the right thing. Now, here's what I want you to do. We're going to take six seconds and pray. And then I'm going to say, okay, guys, wind it down. When I say wind it down, I'm talking in the next couple seconds. You just bring it to a close in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your love. Just finish in the name of Jesus. But, okay, say they said, I just have arthritis in my joints. My elbows are really bad and my knees. Arthritis, you leave. All pain, you go. In Jesus' name, Father, thank you for your love. Who knows you can do that in six seconds? Why am I telling you to pray that way? Matthew 17, if you have faith, you'll say to the mountain, move. And what will the mountain do? It'll move. The just will live by faith. Amen. All things are possible to them that believe. So we're believers tonight. We're involved. We're active. And you might not understand how much Jesus likes this right here. You'll see in a minute. Like, can you tell I'm under no pressure? Yeah. And I'm not going to pray over top you. I'm going to let you pray with your person. I know you don't believe this. I'm going to actually stay quiet for six seconds. It's going to be a miracle. I'm not going to pray over top of you. I'm just going to let you pray with your person. If they're rotator cuffs tore, rotator cuff, you be healed. Shoulder, you move freely in Jesus' name. Who knows six seconds you can do that. After we're done praying, I want you to take your time. I'm going to say, wind it down. And, and, and when you're being prayed for, I just want you to know he loves you or he'd have never sent his son. That's all I want you to think about. Don't be like, <laughs> don't do that. I've seen, I've been around us a long time and I know how we are and we mean well, but we think that's receiving like just chill tonight to say, wow, if you didn't love me, you'd have never sent your son. Thanks for what you're doing in my body. Let the person pray for you. Don't pray with them. Don't just, just don't even pray. Just let them pray over you. After they stop and say amen, and I'll wrap you all up and say wind it down. And you take your time and check your body, whatever that means for you. Sometimes people get healed. They just know it immediately because they have like a fibromyalgia symptom and it just bleep. Or they'll have sciatic and boop going. They'll have something that's so obvious and it just boop going. And they'll know. So if you know, you know, but make sure you know is what I'm saying. Take your time. Check it. Do what's necessary. Some of you have lived protected. You know what I mean? And you don't do certain things because it's real slow. Just check it. It's not a calisthenic. You just check it and grace will let you know and check it. When you know you're healed, make sure I know that you're healed and go like this. Okay. When you know you're healed, go like this. Now listen, if already, did your body already change? Really, that's really something. Remember I said you have no idea how much Jesus likes this maybe? What did you stand up for? So it just went away? How bad was it? Just miserable, just kind of, just, just, yeah, but just miserable, just like distracting. As soon as you stood up, it was gone. You'd been swallowing. It's not there at all. Wow. It's good. No, that's good. Is that your husband? Jesus. No, no, no just kidding. Oh, 
She said I was going to call fire down. <laughs> this is my opportunity. Fire! <laughs> It'll never be the same. <laughs> no, that's just sweet. That's just a little kiss on the cheek for us. That's just, Jesus is here. I mean, you watch and see what he does in these six seconds. It's fun. And it's because we're all participating and dare believing at some level. Like, just think, when you stood up, there's a level of faith in that. When the person stood up with you, there's a level of faith, no matter how nervous they were and no matter how unsure you were. Here we are, right? So when you know you're healed, go like this. Now watch. If you check your body and it seems the same, do not disconnect. Don't run your mind. What am I doing wrong? See, I said I'd never stand up again in one of these services because nothing ever changes. There's got to be something blocking my healing and I don't know what. Stop. Like no night is a good night for that. Tonight is definitely not the good night for that. I just want you to stay in a place of thankfulness. Well, God, I know that you love me. You never sent your son. Listen to a couple testimonies. And after they share their testimony, just between you and Jesus in your body, check yourself again in a thankful heart and thank him. He's a healer. Wow, that's amazing what you did in her. Wow, that's so awesome, God. Then you check your body again. And I'm telling you, don't disconnect. And like popcorn, we'll see things changing. As we don't change our mind. Yeah. Yeah. All right? Yes. If you feel somewhat changed and you don't want to raise your hand because it's 60%, 80%, and not all the way, because I want you, when you know you're healed, I want you to raise your hand. If you're 60, 70, 80, just tap your person and say, hey, I'm like 60% healed. You ought to be excited. Don't, don't say, I wonder why I'm walking in a 60% anointing. <laughs> no. Say, wow, that's amazing. Man, I'm going to pray one more time, okay? And let's just thank God. God, thank you for what you're doing. And man, I know you're a finished work. And I just thank you complete wholeness in Jesus' name. And get them to check it again. I've been on the streets and I've prayed for people two, three, four, five times. And they keep getting better. I've never had anybody on the street say, no, you can stop now. If they know they're getting better, they're like, bring it on, dude. (laughs) Seriously. Are you all ready? So you're going to pray for six seconds. We're going to inventory our bodies. As soon as you know you're healed, you got to let me know. Make sure you know, though, you check yourself real good. Y'all remember what you're praying for? Y'all ready? Look at them. Make them real uncomfortable. Look at them real gushy-eyed like like they're worthy of the blood, worthy of the death of Jesus. They're special to the Father. Can you look at them like really like make them uncomfortable? Are y'all ready? Okay, you got six seconds to pray the kingdom, okay? You ready? Go. Okay, start winding that down right now. Just wrap it up in the name of Jesus because Father loves them. Just wrap it up. That's great. Just wrap it up. That was quick. That was good. In Jesus' name. Okay, the people that were prayed for, I want you to begin to check your bodies, whatever that means to you. Just start checking your bodies. Take your time. I don't want any exaggeration. As soon as you know you're healed, I need you to go like this. You already know for sure? Yeah? You do for sure? Awesome. Check your bodies. That's quick. That's people that really know. You know for sure? You do too? Wave your hands so I can pick you out in the crowd. You? You back there in the back? Yeah? You look excited. That's good. Anybody else? Check your bodies. That's a lot of hands coming up. That youngster in the back? Woo! Right here? Oh my goodness. I want, can that lady, can can somebody, can you tell me what happened? Are we going to be able to hear her? Do you have a mic we can run to people? I want to hear a couple of these testimonies. She's back there crying. I want to hear what happened to her. That's just fun, man. See, when you know your own body and you know you change, you can't, you can't make your emotions, right? You get overwhelmed sometimes when the reality of these things hit you. What's going on back there? They're they're bringing you a microphone. Don't be afraid of it. My knees were just bone to bone bone for the last three years. Y'all hear that? Bone on bone knees? Go ahead. That gives me a really bad backache. And everything is gone. What about... What about your knees? They're okay? Are you bending them and you feel good? 
How easy would it have been to find pain in your knees? Like a half a second? Oh yeah. Do you hear her emotion? Oh yeah. She's lived with this for how long? Three years. You have no trace of nothing in your body. Ah! Oh, Jesus! Yeah! See, that's why she's crying. Come on. She lived with that for three years. She knows what her body feels like. And all of a sudden, boom. And the cynicist would say, well, it's just emotion. She just wants to believe she's healed. So she believes she's healed. And no, don't you sell Jesus that cheap. Yeah. Tonight is completely gone. That's a big deal. Was it pretty extreme? It was loud? Yeah? Gone. Ah! Jesus. Who else knows you're healed? Who else waved their hand? Sir. There was a cyst behind my knee. And it was keeping me from motion. And now it feels like warm water just rolling down my back. <laughs> and you're bending it? And it ain't there? Ah! Come on. You see why I wasn't under pressure? Because I can't produce anything. He's just this way. Jesus is like this. Now watch. It's not because we prayed so powerful and so right. We kept this so simple. There's not even music playing. <laughs> we just believe he's this way. And some of us in our own nervousness. Who, who participated and you weren't all that confident. But you participated because you're here. And you stepped out because of the atmosphere. And you said, I'm just going to get involved. Yeah, good. Thanks for being honest. And look what he does. Yeah? What's up? The first time that she prayed, I didn't really feel it. It felt like I was 50, 60%. Then she prayed again and, and uh, Completely. it's gone. What was it? What was it going on? I had a little kick. I had an accident years ago. Okay. I'm smashing my knee. I've got wires in it and everything. I can still feel the wires in it, but when I was going down, it would crackle. And I, now it yeah, doesn't do that. Yeah, it anymore. would impair you. So you don't feel limited like you were, and you feel like you have strength and motion that was not there. Yeah, it was, like, okay. it was always a kink when I was like this far down. Okay. Kind of kink. Between, who down. prayed for you? This lady right here? This she lady. can believe for this. We're going to take the mic and pass around. Take your time. Pray that any effect, can you feel the wires with your hands? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just pray that that even changes. I pray the wires disappear in Jesus' name. I pray that your wholeness comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, yeah. not me. Amen. Give him the mic. No, I want you to lay your hand right on his knee. Give him the mic. He's going to take a couple more testimonies. Just pray between you and him and Jesus. I want you to lay your hand right on where the, the knee is and just pray that the evidence of those wires would disappear. I had a lady in a service. She went back to North Carolina to the doctor that did the surgery because she had no feeling of screws or anything. He did the x-ray. He personally put the screws in. None of them were on the x-ray. None of them. You say, well, I don't believe that. No, I understand. There's a lot of unbelief in the church, but that's what happened. <laughs> Prayed for my eyesight. I can see the clock is at 917 right now, and I can see the second hand, which I couldn't even see before. I couldn't see the clock before. And oh, my goodness, sir. That's what I wanted to just ask you. Okay, so we can appreciate this. Before they prayed, before they prayed, what would you have seen? I wouldn't have been able to tell what time it was. Okay, you'd have just been able to see that that was probably a clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you have even been able to see the outline of the I, numbers or the hands or? I wouldn't be able to tell which number it was on or anything like that. Okay, so but it I can see very distorted. I can see the second hand, the red second hand right now. Wow. And my hearing is cleared up too. And your hearing? My hearing. <laughs> ah, this is so good. Jesus, we love you. Yes. Who else? You know you were healed when we prayed. There's a couple hands back there. We got a couple hands. We'll take some more testimonies. If you don't feel completely healed, have your person pray. If you didn't feel any change, just listen to a couple testimonies and keep checking your body with me, okay? Go ahead. I have a, uh, it's a from genetic macular disease. I can't even say the word. Yeah, macular degenerate Degener disease. Since I'm 25. And I can see your face with my glasses on. Hey guys, on. listen to this. Just listen to this. Hear her tears? I this have is... not been able to see that clear. She hasn't. And she wasn't is... even able to make out my face. Macular degenerate. She can make me out. You can see how good looking I am? Yes, you see how fabulous. trim my beard is and stuff? Yeah? I just... I... Oh, Lord Jesus. It's been such a demon on me. 
It's something I kept wanting to get rid of, and I've begged God, but I didn't say it right. I didn't ask right. Well, look what we did tonight. Yes. We made it real simple. He loves us. It's not works. He just loves us, and it's nothing we can do. It's what we believe, right? And he's for us, and the, the, the years of the macular degenerate is never allowed and should never be allowed to challenge his love. His love is settled, people. Christ was crucified, right? Okay, Pastor, Pastor, put your hand on her shoulder. Stretch your hands to her. Father, I just thank you for the grace of God in her life. And I just thank you that this is a season of growth like she's never experienced in spiritual understanding. And I just pray that the love of God would consume her and embrace her and envelop her in her life. Yeah, Holy Spirit, just come and absolutely illuminate her understanding. The most peace you've ever known in your life. I don't know why I hear this about nighttime, but nighttime will never be a dread. Nighttime will be a joy to you. And you will wake up knowing Him and loving Him because of His great love for you. I declare these things over you in Jesus' holy name. And Father, I thank you. Your eyes get stronger and stronger, clearer and clearer and brighter and brighter. Zero infirmity in her life in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Who else has a testimony you want to share? Hey, yeah, the little girl right there. Yeah. Oh, honey, you're so precious. Little, is this on? Yeah, it's my mom. So, Yay. praise God. Um, I was going to faint when I stood up. I was like really lightheaded. So it was hitting you that hard? Yeah, I, and I was very, very hot. And I've been sweating so much lately, and I don't know what I, what was going on and why all this stuff is happening. And then they started praying, and I'm like sweating right now. The sweat started, and then I felt a little dizzy, and then I felt fuller and fuller. Um, I still have just a little bit of trembling in my body. Okay. But other than that, does I, it? You I mean feel trembling like, that's associated with what you've been experiencing, or is it just the atmosphere and uh, being touched? I'm not or? sure because okay. I, I tremble a lot from the neurological stuff. So. Okay. Here, this young girl, the young girl that was right here in the eye, the young girl, tap her. Yeah, you. Can you. Are you okay to slide over and gently lay your hand on her forehead? I just saw this, so I'm just doing this. This is good for both of you. Lay your hand right on her forehead and just say, Holy Spirit, come. Just say, Holy Spirit, come. Yeah, that's good. Completely whole. No dizziness. No nervousness. In Jesus' name, whole. Thank you. Now just say this. Say more, Lord. More. In Jesus' name, be whole. Yeah. Amen. That's really good. Thank you, God. What's... Pounding. My heart's pounding, but the shaking was stopping, and I yeah. feel like I'm on fire. <laughs> yeah, you will. Yeah, that whole heart pounding and stuff, I don't think that's that thing right now. I think that's the one that really loves you aggressively. Because <laughs> when you stood up, you can't even, I can't even describe the love of God that hit my heart when you stood up when I had that little word. It was like God, it was like the Lord in me. It's the only way I can describe it. I'm not trying to be weird, guys. It was like, oh. That's what I felt in my heart. It was him. Oh, like he just loves you. Before I came here, um, he whispered something to me that something like this might happen. That he would say how much he loves me because I've been telling him how much I love him. Well, it's not an accident. He called you out of the crowd. Yeah? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Isn't that awesome? What do you think of this, guys? Like... Any more testimonies that somebody wants to share that you know you were healed tonight and you want to share it? Are you guys okay with this? I know it's getting late, but this, you should never get tired of this. My shoulder, my left shoulder, the the pain is gone, but it's still popping. We prayed twice now. Okay. It's still popping. The pain isn't there anymore. Okay, but the pain left. Normally, would there be pain there if you rotated it like that? Yeah. Here's what you do in a situation like that. Don't let the symptom of popping change a thing. You leave here tonight. Wow, Father, what you're doing is amazing. Thanks for taking away that pain and making all things new. You get in the bathroom, you're getting ready for bed, freshening up, whatever. God, I just so appreciate your love for me. You go to bed in that place, you live in that place. That's how your body changes, right? You come here tonight and you get prayed for and you don't feel totally well. You crawl in bed and your hip grabs you and you think, 
Oh man, there it goes again. Why wasn't I healed tonight? No, don't ever go there. As soon as it tries to bite you, right? Wow, Father, I so thank you for what you're doing in my life. Your love for me is unstoppable, undeniable. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a Christian. That's how you live. Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody else you feel important to share a testimony? You were healed and you want to testify. Yes. Um, I was, you're back, back there, you know, yammering or whatever. You're like, you're, we're going to pray. You're like kept on, you know, praying. I was like, I thought we we're going to pray, you know. And their, their heads got tired, so they, locked, they dropped their heads. <laughs> but even before they prayed, I just felt this warm going down my back. And I, I, it was my job. I'm bending over a lot. Okay. And sitting down, like, kind of crouched like this. And it, it was just bothering me like crazy. And, yeah, they just kind of got tired of waiting on you, I guess. So they prayed? So what? It, they it, jumped the gun on us and Jesus was okay with that? So like, whoo! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Who prayed for you? These two right here? So that yeah. means Jesus lives in you guys, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and another thing that left is like, like you, you opened my eyes to a lot of the deception that I was believing. Okay. You know, uh, identity. Yeah. Uh, stuff like that. that and we'll talk about that all and, weekend. You know, and which you know, believing that I, I was a m- m- mistake or whatever. Yeah. Or right. Like, no way. You know, doesn't matter if, if I was born out of wedlock or not. You know, God doesn't created matter. me. You know. And for all that stuff. So, yeah. That's it's beautiful. Been, yeah, I, I'll plan on being here to get more and more of that Good. stuff exposed. So, Good. Yeah. And, Amen. Yeah, That's great what he just said. You guys realize that God is the giver of life? He's the author and giver of life? So if life comes, who said so? Right? Yeah. Who? Somebody have a mic over there? Yeah, go ahead. Um, he's been having back pain for the last few weeks and tonight it's completely gone he completely has no, no pain that's so good thank you jesus who who here that you testified or you didn't testify yet you weren't all the way healed when we started or you didn't feel changing you listened to a few testimonies and you actually your body changed in the process of just listening to a few testimonies anybody have that experience yeah Yeah, see how important it is? Yeah, look at that. See how important it is to not change your mind based on symptoms, results, and intellect? You lock into truth, and truth makes you free. Anybody else want to testify before we leave? Anybody? I'm just feeling a whole lot. There was a couple other hands. I just want to give you the opportunity. You don't necessarily have to. I've been here and holding you a long time. But this stuff's fun for me. It never gets old. Somebody want to share a testimony? Go ahead. We'll take you yet. Um, so I still feel some pain. But it's like a, it's like a smooth. I just feel like a smooth. You just know body, something's like, changing yeah. in your body. And the word you gave that woman over there. God's like, baby girl, that's for you too. So I received that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not complete. I made whole in my heart. He's, he's talking about the heart condition too, not just a phys- physical condition, but uh-huh. he's soothing, healing in my heart and in my body. And it's just really smooth and beautiful. he's just gentle. No, it's beautiful. Listen, if you, yeah, thank you, Lord. If you were prayed for tonight and you're not all the way there right now, or you didn't feel your body change like you were hoping and believing, do not Do not leave here with any other thought than, wow, thank you for loving me. Thank you for what you're doing in me. I so appreciate you making me whole. Go to bed that way. Wake up. Check your body. You live that way. Does that make sense? Amen? Amen. Can we do something? I know we might not all be on the same page of this, but I feel feel this in my heart, and I feel like it would be a humble thing. It doesn't mean you're charismatic or Pentecostal. It just means you're yielding to Him. Can we lift our hands before the Lord, like the Bible says, holy hands to the Lord, and just yield to Him? And as you're doing that, just start thanking Him in your heart for teaching, for healing, for demonstrating, for just being who He is. Would you begin with your hands raised just to personally talk to Him for uh, just just a few seconds of just that you're thankful for something? For something. Go ahead. Yield to him. This is what clay does. It just yields. So Father, we just hands raised before you. We thank you for this night. We thank you for revelation, understanding. Continue to burn in our hearts with truth. Continue to give truth all weekend long. I would ask, Lord, that you only speak through me what you want to be said and what you would say if Pastor Robert gave you a mic. And we thank you. How about it, guys, for all the healings and all the things you're doing in our midst. 
And here's what I'm going to ask with hands raised that God, you just let this be a beginning of great things to come. And I'm just going to declare this. I wouldn't be afraid to say as if it would be almost like a prophecy form, but I don't want to freak people out with that. But I, I declare that this is the beginning of great things to come, that God begin to move and restore and heal in our lives as we step out and keep believing and give him opportunity. I feel like we have barely scratched the surface of what's right in front of us. So we're going to continue on, not grow weary in well-doing, and we're going to reap because we're not going to lose heart in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Love you. Thank you. What time tomorrow? You want to close? If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmolerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.